Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terra Podcast, Season 10, Episode 39. He's Dave Bryan. I'm Alex Kazor, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for being with us this Wednesday, Steelers Nation. Dave, uh, just just a good week. I don't have a good intro really here to start this time. I know it's getting cold. Some snow in the area for uh, Western PA, I think, for Thursday. Uh, it's, I assume there's no snow in the forecast out in Vegas. No, but it's crisp. It got the crisp mornings out here. I, I really like mornings out here uh, this time of year out in Vegas. Uh, uh, kind of wakes you up real quick. Uh, what, what, you know, step outside first thing in the morning and walk the dog or whatnot, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, wow, football, football weather is is upon us. And and hey, let let me start things off with uh, uh, I evidently was uh, a little bit uh, typical Dave uh, in the, in that last show. Alex and I got into kind of a spirited, I, I guess you'd call it spirited discussion about out about Bud Dupree there, and uh, I think I, I, I said something along the lines of, of Alex's comprehension, something, something's wrong with his comprehension <laughs> or something like that. Alex, I, I apologize if I came off uh, too strong like that in typical uh, uh, my fashion. I, I just I felt like I was being uh, painted, I guess, in kind of in the wrong light with what I had said previously about about Dupree, you know, that uh, that you know, I, I do indeed think that he will get paid that amount of money. I just am not convinced that it'll be from the Steelers. So, uh, I, you know, a, f- a few readers reached out and said I was a little strong there. So I went back and listened to it, and, and indeed I was. So I apologize for that. Hey, it's all good. Hey, the good news is hey, Bud Dupree's playing well. We can have a spirited debate about how well Bud Dupree's playing, and that's a conversation I wasn't sure that we would even be having, you know, this point back in in, in the summer. So. Let's move on, and, and speaking of it being football weather, and it's football season with the Steelers winning and things feeling good right now, but a flurry of roster moves since our last show, Dave. We'll take them kind of as they came. Steelers yesterday put rookie inside linebacker Ulysses Gilbert the third on injured reserve with a back uh, injury. He's had recurring back spasms for about the last two weeks. Tomlin had already ruled him out of Sunday's game against the Rams uh, during his Tuesday press conference, but now his season is over. To take his place on the 53-man roster, Robert Spillane was promoted from the practice squad. Spillane had spent in camp with the team, been on the practice squad for most of the season, had a nice preseason, uh, and we'll get the NFL call up now. Uh, the Steelers also released running back Darren Hall from the practice squad as the running backs get healthier. They signed back tight end Kevin Rader, who spent the entire preseason with the team and uh, spent most of the season on the practice squad as well, added receiver Terry Wright out of Purdue, a speedster uh, rookie. And then today, the team also announced that they've added an old face or new kind of old new face Sutton Smith six round pick signed back to the practice squad after getting cut outright at the end of the preseason so a lot of roster moves there the highlight here is obviously give with the third unfortunately going on IR yeah and you know being as how they uh, first of all uh, did I not say that maybe uh, Robert Splane might be the first one to to uh, to get promoted there? Uh, actually, te- technically, I guess wasn't. It was uh, uh, the, the the young running back there uh, this past weekend. Oh, Tony Brooks James. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I guess he'd be the first one there. But anyway, uh, uh, Spillane, because you know because of his special teams ability. You know that that mm-hmm. that helped play into this, I'm sure, because you talk about a guy in in Ulysses Gilbert who he was leading he was leading the team in special team snaps, was he not? Yeah, uh, by eight, I think he played 150 this year, which is even more than Medikevich or anyone like that. So it was he was having a, a good year, and, and that one bummed me out a little bit. And Spillane, you know, he had some flashes there, not necessarily on on special teams, although you did notice him running down, you know, getting downfield on special teams. I think he only had like one assisted special teams tackle I think during the preseason but uh, he showed some range there uh, you know uh, defensively an inside linebacker which of course we hope we never have to see him play that position there but uh, makes a logical logical choice there uh, to replace Ulysses Gilbert on on the 53 and you know man you know you hate to hate hate to see that for Ulysses Gilbert the third but uh, kind of stunts his growth a little bit if you will so now we'll wait until Unfortunately, probably until next uh, next year during training camp will be the next time we uh, we start hearing about him uh, again. And as far as uh, Sutton Smith 
being back. You know, Mike Tomlin didn't mention any outside linebacker injuries there uh, when he talked uh, to the media on Tuesday there. And being as how the team didn't add back uh, buddy J. Ron Elliott, and with Roosevelt Knicks kind of dealing with a, a minor knee issue again, makes you wonder if old Sutton Smith might not might might <laughs> get a rep or two at the fullback position here uh, th- this this go around. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, it, that that certainly makes sense. And then you know, I guess they want to just bring him back. It was a little curious to see Sutton Smith circle back. Usually, those guys that get cut outright don't end up circling back, even with some of the injuries the Steelers have experienced. But we'll see if this guy sticks. Maybe it looks better uh, with a, a little more seasoning and kind of you know the, the wake up call of getting cut in the NFL with Spillane. To go back to that briefly, I agree. A uh, big hitter is kind of the number one takeaway with Robert Spillane is that he's a pretty marginal athlete. But whenever he gets his hands on you, uh, the guy delivers a pop. Yeah, he does. So uh, we'll, we'll, I mean, qu- quite a bit of shuffling going on. I don't know what to make of uh, them letting the other, you know, the other uh, hall, you know, go. Maybe that's a good sign uh, when it comes to maybe a guy like James Conner this week. But uh, Mike Tomlin did say that James Conner is probably going to be limited to start the week here uh, with the week actually in first practice being I guess technically today, uh, the injury report be the first injury report of uh, this week will be out after the Wednesday practice. Uh, Ramon Foster supposed to get back to I guess back to my original thought there. I mean, uh, I I guess we can take it as a pretty decent side that that at least Trey Edmonds and his ribs are going to be okay, and maybe there's a chance that as Mike Tomlin said that James Conner will perk up by the end of the week. But I, I got to tell you, listening to that interview that James Conner gave the other night on uh, on ninety three point seven, the fan he didn't sound too convincing. <laughs> what did he say? Status quo. Uh, yeah, crazy? not only that, that, uh, you know, he wasn't going to put no timetable on it and, and that kind of really kind of downplayed it, but also said he wasn't ready to rule himself out this week. So, you know, listening to that interview and, and the context, it, I didn't get warm and fuzzies about it, but, mm-hmm. uh, you know, maybe, maybe he'll perk up by the end of the week and boy, they sure could, they sure, sure could use him back. I hope so, but if he's status quo, and the status quo most recent is that he missed the week, then that sounds like he's on track to miss it again. So we'll have to wait for the injury report, and we'll see. Maybe he does perk up, as you said, but right now it sounds, again, we'll call it highly questionable for James Conner. Yeah, and who else was on the injury report? Uh, Edmonds? Switzer. Uh, Did he even mention – Tom even mention Switzer? Did he mention Switzer? I know he mentioned him post game. I don't know if he mentioned him yesterday. I don't but think I, he, I, I don't think he mentioned him yesterday. Yeah, you're right. Switzer with ribs. Uh, uh, let's see, Edmonds with ribs. Uh, Foster supposed to return back, and Foster was also on 93.7. The fan he made made it sound like he'll be back playing this week, and I think that's it. Uh, well, so, oh, yeah. well, uh, Nick's with the knee. Yeah, Nick's, the Nick's with the knee. And uh, uh, of course, Ulysses Gilbert the third, but he's since been placed on IR. So team, I guess in that sense, pretty good health-wise coming off the Colts game. Nothing really new that Tomlin had to say injury report. We'll just kind of let the practice report uh, tell us what's going to go on. I'm sure a lot of guys will sit out on, on early in the week as become common with the, the bumps and bruises as you get uh, late and deep into a season. But uh, other than that, not a whole lot from an injury report standpoint. But let's talk about what else Tomlin was asked about. Uh, oh, oh ben, 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 Benny Snell's out this week. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, I think, yeah, I think most people knew that. But you're right. Yeah, Tomlin did confirm Benny Snell will miss at least another weekend had that knee surgery to uh, trim the meniscus uh, after getting hurt against, was that Miami? He got hurt. Uh, anyway, let's go to Tomlin's press conference. And I, there wasn't a whole lot, really. He was asked, ta- asked about the Rams a lot. And Aaron Donald was talked about quite a bit. But I thought the most interesting thing Tomlin said, and this was obvious, I think, when you watched the game, was that the Steelers did not do a good job of winning the line of scrimmage. We really, defensively, I think, for sure. Offensively, they could have run the ball better, too. So that's you know the, the, a hallmark of this team, being able to win in the trenches with a good offensive line, a good front seven. Um, that's something that has to get better. And they won't be able to get away with it against the Rams the way they got away with it ultimately against the Colts. Right, and you you got Todd Gurley coming to town, and not not a bad offensive line I don't think overall with them. Uh, so yeah, the, you know another test for the for the for the steer. I mean, Cooper Cup, that guy, <laughs> that 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 guy looks looks great in a little bit of film study I've al- already done, and Tomlin hit on that as well. Uh, of course, Jared Goff there at 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 at, at quarterback. And yeah, uh, you know, I guess one of the things that stuck out 
to me that Tomlin said was about the running game and, and you know, obviously wasn't a big surprise uh, to hear him say what, what he did about it. He says, we've got to run the ball better on offense. Here, here. Uh, he says, we've got to run the ball better on offense, particularly in the waning moments of the game. Uh, we weren't able to maintain possession of the ball. I thought they won the line of scrimmage. We've got to be better in those areas. And really, I mean... <sighs> You know, outside of, of, you know, they, they had a couple of good, you know, good runs, obviously, against the Dolphins where there showed some life, a little bit of life there at times. And, of course, against the Colts, they had the Edmonds uh, 40-something yard run early in the game. There wasn't too much to get excited about. In fact, the Steelers running backs combined to rush for 83 yards on 21 carries against the Colts, Alex. 40, does, that, that, does that include Edmonds run? Yes. Uh, wow. four, 45 of those yards came on the Edmonds long run, so that means that the other 20 running back runs netted 38 yards. Mm. Uh, I don't, I'm don't. i not excellent at math, but uh, I know that's less than two yards per <laughs> carry uh, on those. Only six of the 21 total running back carries were what, we, what I like to call successful ones, and none of the five running back rushes in the fourth quarter of the game were successful as well. So that's... Uh, uh, that's obviously a little bit of, con- of concern. And, you know, Sunday against uh, Sunday against the Rams, the Steelers will face the Los Angeles Rams defense that has allowed just 3.56 yards per carry this season. Now, yards per carry uh, is, is it can be a deceiving stat. But I think when you go go, you know, play by play and look at success rates, you know, it's probably a good successful rate uh, that their defense has against opposing running games. So. That's why I kind of said, boy, it'd be good to get James Conner back. And Tomlin kind of pointed a finger there at 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 at, at Edmonds, you know, uh, at, at one point during there during it as well too. He said that uh, uh, you know Edmonds uh, Edmonds needs more exposure in terms of ball placement, and what he particularly meant by that was the. Second and goal rushing attempt from the Colts' one-yard line uh, with 156 left in the first quarter. We'll remember that's the play that DeCastro pulled on. If you go back and look at uh, slow that thing down and 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 look at the all you know the end zone all 22 version of that. You know he if he bounces that outside he walks into the end zone. In fact, DeCastro gives him the old what the heck you know uh, kind kind of sign there. Uh, as, as well, so uh, definitely something that Edmonds needs to work on moving forward. Yeah, if he gets the chance, if uh, James Conner comes back, obviously Edmonds is not going to touch the ball a whole lot. Let me ask you this, Dave. Just overall, not just from the Colts game, though that's a big part of it because that's the most recent one. What are you more concerned with, the Steelers' rushing offense or their rushing defense? Uh, rushing offense. Really? I, I lean defense just because knowing, you know, that game, obviously they needed to run the ball better, but you didn't have James Conner. You're going to get him back sooner rather than later. Maybe not for the Rams game, but you'll have him uh, probably two weeks from now, uh, worst case scenario. But the rush defense has kind of been an issue throughout the entire season where I just felt like piles move forward too much. They've allowed too many, you know, running backs to get to the second level pretty clean. And um, they've had issues against Seattle, San Francisco, the Colts game. Even the Bengals ran well back in that blow at victory Pittsburgh had back in, what was that, week three, week four, uh, whenever that was. And so I think, you know, with the loss to it, not having anyone coming back into the mix, the way the Steelers' rushing attack will have Connor return and getting Roosevelt Knicks back too uh, these last two weeks. I think the defense, to me, is the bigger concern. Uh, to me, it's the offense, man. It sure would be nice to help Mason out a little bit with, uh, you know, with, with some mm-hmm. running. And like I said, they haven't been from a successful run rate this year uh, aspect. It, it, you know, it hasn't been, you know, it hasn't been great. So, right. uh, I mean, I, I do realize the, the the point that you're making there. And I mean, we're gonna they'll, they'll get tested again. You know, and, mm-hmm. and the Colts are a good running team, right? I mean, we we got we got we got to tip our hat uh, to them, but they they did give up. There there were like I uh, know the one uh, play over there to the right side where Joe Hayden. I thought Joe Hayden did the proper thing at at, at setting the edge, and, and what do you what do you expect him to do against one of those big old lines? Like Quentin Nelson too. Yeah, I mean, what, I mean, what 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 do you want him to do other than keep the run inside? You know, and this was the 24 yard run by Mar- Marlon Mack for people not sure what we're talking about. Right. And what else, you know, went on in there? Somebody, I think, missed a fill 
uh, mm-hmm. in, uh, in in there somewhere. So uh, uh, you can't give up. It's bad enough to give up a you know a, a successful run, but to give uh, those you know explosive plays. We know what a premium those are in 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 games. And if you're going to give up some of those during a game, you would expect most of them to be passes along those lines. To kind of I consider those kind of freebies, if you will, if you get an explosive run on offense. You know, of, of 20 yards or more. You know, much like the Steelers got a 40 yard, 40 plus yard gain uh, there on the ground with, with with Edmonds there. So you you gotta you gotta cut those out. And yeah, I think Bugs is a concern uh, in that area. I wonder what uh, you have the uh, you have the charting done. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wonder what the successful run rate was when he was on the field versus when he wasn't. Uh, that might be tough for me to pull up in the middle of the show, but uh, I can maybe throw a stat out there, uh, or, or a little bit later you can take a look at the chart. Uh, no, I, I agree. Is that let me? Be, I want to be clear: is that the Steelers' rushing offense has to be better. There's no denying that they've struggled throughout the year. They've been inconsistent. Do they need to be able to be the strength of this offense for for a young quarterback? Absolutely, both. I think phases have to get better offense and defense. But it's just for me, the defense I point to because it's been popping up all year long. Um, and as guys get worn down, there's no one coming back healthy. Though again, the way that James Conn is returning, um, that's the frustrating part. You're right. The Colts have a good rushing attack. Marlon Mack's a good back, but there were so many missed chances this defense had to get Mack in the backfield to get you know even some of these end arounds and reverses that they could have had in the backfield. And just too many missed tackles, too many piles moving forward, too many yards after contact. So a lot of stuff that was wholly controllable by the Steelers. They just didn't control well enough, and that was the part that concerned me. Yeah, didn't Watt miss like a couple of tackles in mm-hmm. run 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 tackles there now in in Watt's uh, point that that one uh, that one run over to the uh, right side there. What a great job he did with controlling the tight end and then flashing back inside in the gap while under control and then you know after the running back uh, uh, bounced it outside on that one. Uh, uh, Watt's able to bounce back uh, outside too. Now uh, Watt obviously was uh, I thought good in as a pass rusher uh, in this game uh, but his his score or grade according to if you you know how much you buy into pro football focus uh, was was towards the bottom there and it's mostly because they dinged him a lot on on uh, run defense and tackling yeah it's still got to be better across the board um, Watt included as well as those guys are playing and you have elite talents like you know Watt and Hayward and you know, Hargraves playing great this year Dupree's having a career year uh, their run defense still has to be better and I don't think it's been it's typical strong self it's not been terrible obviously but it's there I think there's a lot of uh, room for improvement there and it's not even just about you know getting off block and stuff it's just tackling not allowing yards after contact and just yeah basically just wrapping up and tackling uh all right yeah I mean look uh they both both sides of the ball, uh, like Thomas said. Uh, uh, the Colts won the trenches. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Anything else from Tomlin? Uh, he talked about James Washington making some big plays, but I think we kind of discussed it on Monday's show. To me, his best game uh, in his year and a half of being a Pittsburgh Steeler. Sean Davis, Tomlin says uh, he hasn't given much thought if Davis is going to return from IR because you don't have to des- des- designate those players uh, initially anymore. We'll see if he comes back. I hope he comes back. That'll maybe give this team some more flexibility. Yes, indeed, but he didn't. He he certainly didn't sound like uh, Sean Davis' return is is close. And for those, uh, Sean Davis can you know technically begin practicing any time uh, now. And I think from after six weeks uh, being on IR, he can resume practice. And of course, after eight weeks have expired, is when he can become a designated uh, player to return. So I think the eight week mark will end after this week because uh, I think he went on he went on IR week three. Right? Right after the game against the Seahawks, there, uh, but and, and one would think he would resume practicing first and have that 21-day window open up on him, and then you know a week or two weeks later uh, be be you know a designated to return player. But until he resumes practicing, you know that's that's not going to happen. There's just no sign that that that's in the immediate future. Not saying that it won't happen, maybe here in the next couple weeks, but you know just. Mike Thomas sure didn't sound make it sound like like that's close to happening. Yeah, uh, but he also said he hasn't checked in on it because he doesn't give it much thought to those IR guys until they're basically healthy, and then you can make a decision then. So we'll see. Uh, hopefully, uh, Davis can return and at the very least offer some some good safety depth because I will be terrified if one of the starters go down and I'm seeing Cam Kelly uh, on my screen. That's not a place I want to be. 
Yeah, and boy, I mean, you could go position by. I mean, losing to it was bad enough. You 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 really can't at this point anywhere on that defense afford to lose anybody, right? That's a good point. Yeah, what what position can you most afford to lose someone at? Inside linebacker, maybe. Would that be the position to point to? Yeah, as long as that player ain't Vince Williams or <laughs> or Devin Bush. Okay. <laughs> oh wow. Uh, okay. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I don't even like kind of jinxing this kind of stuff, yeah, yeah, you right, know. Right. Uh, uh, but uh, let's let's just hope that the two and injury uh, was was it for him. But you know, uh, Tom talked about Juju Smith Schuster and you know how he's handled. You know how statistics really don't tell the whole story uh, when it comes to Juju Smith Schuster and his kind of limited uh, production so far this year. And look, Juju Juju Smith Schuster hasn't helped Juju Smith Schuster uh, at a few points uh, so far. I mean, I think we would have both agreed that that interception in the game against the Colts was a ball that he should have caught. Correct. Hundred percent. What about the deep pass down the uh, down the left sideline there <clears throat> early on lot, in the game? Yeah, a lot tougher play, but one that he, I'm sure he would say, and I would say he's got to be able to make that catch. You know, Charlie Batch was on the radio with Stan Saverin yesterday talking about that and uh, referenced Heinz Ward, and Heinz Ward saying, it's always his philosophy, if you got one hand on the football, you should catch it. And mm-hmm. uh, if, if memory serves me, that ball hit two of Juju's hands, you know, and the last time I looked, you only have two of those, most <laughs> most people anyway. Uh, apologies if you have more or less. Uh, but uh, I, I kind of felt that, yeah, it was a little bit underthrown, but that's that's maybe a ball that Juju should have if you're going to be a number one guy like that. So sure. uh, he hasn't you know, helped himself out at times here uh, either. So, look, I mean, teams are obviously doing their best to kind of kind of kind of take Juju away. And I think that was kind of be, to, to be expected in, in you know uh, moving forward here. But uh, I, I still have faith in him that he can make plays. And you know we've seen him already this year make make plays and and do things after the catch. And you need a little bit more of that moving forward there. So you know Mike Tomlin was just quick to point out that uh, you know he's, he's handled all this great and you know how he's done relative and statistics are probably two different things. I, I agree, but uh, I know that journey for Juju won't get any easier this weekend when he faces Jalen Ramsey and Ooh. Eric Weddle and company. Uh, that's going to be a, a big five-star matchup for him, so it might not be a whole lot easier statistically this week. Uh, do, do you want to reference what Charlie Batch said? Because Batch had some really good information on Mason Rudolph, because I think you know, we'll get off Tomlin here because he, I think he talked about everything that was important. Um, Batch was on – what was he on yesterday? The, uh, Stan Saverin show on ESPN. Yeah. Okay, and he got, he says he's fully confident in Mason Rudolph, and obviously, you know, Batch has been in that situation before, a former quarterback himself for a long time. Um, what, you want to recap kind of what Batch said and some of the plays that Rudolph may have missed, but also some plays where, you know, his guys, like you said, didn't really help out his quarterback. Yeah, and look, I mean, I love Charlie Batch and all, and, and, and him playing quarterback position in the NFL for 15 years definitely holds a lot of clout. I don't know how much team bias – you know, there is because after all, he does, you know, he's broadcaster for a team and and, and and probably going to be a little bit more, uh, I guess, guess a little bit more forgiving. But I mean, he really had a lot of positive things to say about Rudolph. He says uh, uh, he's going through his reads. He's getting to the proper guy. Uh, uh, you know, he's probably not pressing it down the field as much as, as, as he would probably like. So he's taking that underneath coverage and, and taking what's what's given him. So it's fine from that perspective. Uh, he wonders kind of maybe when you get spooked early, early in games. You know, Rudolph obviously hasn't had – I guess great statistical starts. Well, definitely the game against the, the Dolphins wasn't great, but uh, I thought uh, coming out initially, uh, he made a couple of good throws in that game against the Colts, and unfortunately that one to uh, to Juju went off his hands and was intercepted. And he kind of wonders maybe, uh, you know, if maybe that's working on his psyche a little bit early in the games. But he did go on to point out that Juju had both hands on, and he's got to figure out a way to way to catch that football. Uh, uh, he says, so So those are the things, if it happens early, maybe it shies him away from taking those shots down the field. Uh, he says that long, deep pass to James Washington late in the game, one of his last throws, he almost had identical uh, coverage, and he was looking to throw it deep. Unfortunately, and, and, I, and, and technically, I don't think this was James Washington. I think Charlie had his players mixed up. I think it was Johnny Holton uh, mm-hmm. on that particular play. This was... Uh, 
damn, what was the time stamp on that? But it was it, it was late in the game there. Uh, I think it was third and third and nine or third and third and long, whatever it was. Uh, uh, and I put a gif gif of that up on my Twitter feed late last night there. Uh, he had Holton streaking down the sideline, down the right sideline there, and, and Jalen Samuels just, I mean, didn't even see the blitzer coming. Mm-hmm. And and uh, came right up the gut and, and got Rudolph right, you know, right as he's releasing the ball. Uh, the ball only went, what, about 12 yards or, or whatnot. And they, didn't they initially try to roll that or, or let yeah, it? Yeah, a, a touchdown, a fumble yeah, touchdown. Yeah, let, let it play out so, to, to kind of uh, refresh everybody's mind on that play. But, boy, it certainly looks like Holton has, that, has a win on the outside on that play, and it makes you wonder, maybe, maybe that's a home run. You know, we'll never mm-hmm. know. You know, I obviously, uh, but, but he referenced that thinking, uh, uh, what did he say specifically? Unfortunately, yeah, Jalen Samuels didn't pick up the blitz and linebacker and he was able to disrupt that play, but man, that would have been another play on the field. And maybe we wouldn't be having these conversations about whether Mason is foot is pushing the football down the field. He's got a great point, but I mean, we, you, you know, I don't know how, how much you want to live in the if and buts and what, uh, uh, you know, uh, realm here, but you know we referenced the one down the sideline early in the game to Juju, and then you reference this one where Samuels doesn't doesn't pick up uh, the guy he's supposed to pick up. I mean, if he hits those two long, long, long plays, we're looking at his stats a little bit differently, and maybe we're looking at him having another touchdown uh, in 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 this game as well too. Uh, he went on to talk about his footwork and and maybe that he stays on Reeds too long at times, and maybe he comes off Reeds uh, too quickly. He pointed out, and you and I referenced this play the other day, Alex. The uh, the fourth uh, the fourth down and uh, one or two or whatever it was there. Where uh, the shovel pass to Juju, you know, I think the thing that stuck out to me originally, just looking at the TV TV tape, was man, he should have hit uh, uh, Deontay Johnson in, in you know, on, on that play, kind of on that leak out uh, to the right hand side there, and and Charlie kind of agreed with that, saying that's that's a two way option. Uh, there's a quick out, and then all of a sudden there's Juju underneath uh, on the shovel pass, and unfortunately he didn't stay with Johnson long enough. Uh, he referenced one other one, and boy, this one. Uh, we could probably spend, if you let me, 45 minutes on this one. So don't let me. Uh, backed up in the own end zone in the safety there. You look at the all 22 and you get this thing going by frame by frame, Alex. Uh, that that kind of in and out route. What do you like to call that route? I call it a pivot route. Okay, a pivot route there. I mean, I've heard it's called like an angle route or Texas route. You know, in and out route. So uh, uh, basically, the uh, uh, they got. I, I'm convinced they got the look that they wanted defensively because uh, Rudolph uh, motions Johnson in from the right side uh, into into more like closer to a bunch. It looked like it was going to be uh, like a cover one, I guess, man uh, in that in that situation there. And you know, Johnson runs kind of a quick in and out. Or, or pivot route as you'd like to call it there and but and when Johnson plants you see that little slide of his that just mm-hmm. that that's that brief little slide and you know we've talked time and time again about him and his footing and all but but that aside when I mean when he's coming out of that break looks like he gets maybe hooked just a tad uh, there and he, he doesn't come out of that break entirely uh, clean and with his head up and Rudolph's cocked ready to go. Uh, pulls that football back and then he pulls it back, you know, and that 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 indecision there. Once he pulls that football back, the rush is on him. He tries to, of course, then, you know, escape out to his right to Noel Bell and, and sack fumble in there. I felt that uh, in that situation and based on based on where where Johnson was in the route and all like that, I think you just got to trust the guy and throw it to a spot and hope your guy comes down with it and worst case scenario, it falls incomplete and you're punting the football. I'm with you. you the one thing you can't do there is take a sack. The other thing you can't do there is lose, lose control of the football. So I think you throw it out wide to the right, hope Johnson can make a play. If not, you punt and, and, and you fight another day. Obviously, it all kind of worked out based on the – Force fumble on a safety uh, punt, uh, the ensuing kick there, but you know that's not good quarterback play, and that to me again was his worst play Sunday was taking that sack, and I've charged him now the last three weeks being responsible for all three sacks the Steelers have allowed. Uh, has been on the offensive line one bit, so those are the 
the ills and the growing pains of a young quarterback. But but uh, yeah, he, he missed a couple receivers. The fourth down play you mentioned, um, some on general lucky stuff, like you said, you know him getting. Uh, hit on that third down play where he could have hit Holton downfield. He did miss Holton really bad on another play, I think, in the first half of that game. Um, now, you know, sometimes you're going to miss open receivers, just not being there in the progression. And sometimes that does happen when you, you throw enough passes in, in the NFL. But but it wasn't it wasn't an awful game. It wasn't a great game by any means. I thought he took largely what the defense gave him. The Colts really weren't allowing a whole lot over the top. They really kind of forced the, the ball underneath. So I understand why. Rudolph did that, and in most instances, he took a profit, and I'm not going to get too mad about a young quarterback taking a profit and moving uh, the ball a little bit as opposed to forcing it all the time. I think, and I'm with you, I, you know, that uh, that 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 uh, safety there was probably the most, the single most egregious play of his in the game. A lot of people have been asking, will you guys look at the film and, and uh, see if check down Charlie Rudolph uh, you know, pro- pro- could have made some more plays down the field. I'm 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 with you. I think the one uh, uh, potentially maybe to, didn't he end up uh, having uh, uh, Samuels as as a safety valve just sitting way outside to the left on that one to Holton that you're talking about there, where kind of avoid the rush and 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 really probably didn't have his eyes up where he could have hit Holton uh, to the left side. Didn't he end up going to Samuels out to the left on that one? Mm-hmm. I believe it was a gain of nine. Okay, and, and well, I mean, look, you got nine on the play, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, I know we're supposed to look at the process too here. Uh, I think maybe there was maybe one other time to uh, Vance McDonald uh, down the field about nine yards, maybe where he could have hit him. But I, I got the feeling overall, especially on the plays, because look, a, a few of those were designed uh, uh, screens, right? You know, uh, uh, to Rudolph, a couple of those receptions, I mean, to uh, Samuels were, were design kind of kind of plays. And then the uh, there was a des- design uh, tight end, you know, kind of kind of screen, if you will, to the left side there that the uh, blockers out front really didn't help may uh, didn't help uh, out uh, McDonald on that play. But I think the other, let's say six or seven kind of check downs to Samuels specifically. I'm with you. I didn't see anybody open downfield. And mm-hmm. I, uh, I late last night I saw where Merrill Hodge was on Steelers Live. And once again, I don't know how much you're playing into into team bias here because, you know, how how much you know, <laughs> how how much is the bias in play with guys like like Charlie Batch and and, and Merrill Hodge? Uh, but he says he he didn't see a lot of open down the field on a lot of those checkdowns to Samuels either there. So uh, it did feel like the Colts had those corners up on the wide receivers quite a bit during the game. And then when not, you know, they, they weren't, they weren't, uh, they were set more in, in, you know, some quarters type coverage and all not allowing to get beat uh, down the field. And it just kind of, you know, mandated that, that Rudolph take, take a lot of that easy stuff underneath. And I thought the area where the offense struggled the most, which was in the red zone, there was really nothing for Rudolph down there. I couldn't find a single play where I sat there and went, he should have did X instead of what he actually did. In the red zone, the positive play he had was the, the touchdown advance. Empty set goes through his progressions. You know, McDonald's basically his fourth progression in the play and hits him and, and they get in the end zone. So I thought you know, the Colts really did a nice job in the red zone. They were dropping routinely seven in the coverage. They're not a blitz heavy team. So it really kind of bottled up any sort of throwing windows and, and no one got open. I think guys have to work harder in some of the scramble drill situations that, you know, a lot of the young guys haven't been in before. Um, so I just thought in, in the red zone, especially there was really nothing more Rudolph could have done down there. Uh, Charlie Batch was asked if, uh, you know, obviously since, uh, since Rudolph came out, there's been, you know, uh, utterings about his uh, uh, overall arm strength and whether or not he's got an NFL arm and has enough velocity and all. And Charlie Batch was asked about that as well. He says, not at all, not at all. Just at times there's some shaky footwork and that kind of alters some of his throws. But there were some throws in the game uh, that I was questioning. Man, did, did that come off kind of funky? But yet he's hitting it. He's getting a foot stepped or, or no, but yet he's getting hit. He's getting a foot stepped on. He's not able to follow through because of a pass rush. So when you ask me that question, the short answer is no. I have absolutely no concern on whether this guy can throw the football down the field. Uh, he later goes on to to uh, to 
to make it clear that uh, he thinks Rudolph will continue to develop, develop and make strides during the second half of the season as he gets more experience. Charlie Bat said, this is a guy, remember, he's still a young guy. He's still learning. So we just have to continue to be patient with him. But I'm fully confident in Mason Rudolph. And, you know, we've, we've, we've screened patience with, with him, you know, right from the get-go here. And... <sighs> You know, we, I think you just got to stay in, let, let in, in, in this wait and see mode. Now, obviously, it gets tiring week after week saying, "Well, what if, mm-hmm. what, what if this deep ball, what if that deep ball, uh, you know, kind of thing." Uh, to his credit, in if there was one positive, I think to take away from the game against the Colts was really, I guess there was only just one interceptable pass. And that would have been the one that James Washington made the great, great reach out behind him on the great grab, uh, uh, on, on that play. Uh, I, I don't remember anything else being interceptable in that game. Whereas if you go back to that game against the dolphins, there's probably four balls, right? Mm-hmm. You know, right. Uh, that that you could probably say, well, boy, he got away with 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 one uh, there. So, I, what does he have? Four interceptions on the year. Uh, two of them, uh, two of them went off uh, wide receivers' hands, and two others were just bad decisions. The one against right. the 49ers, kind of forcing back, uh, kind of against the grain there, uh, rolling out. And then the other one to Juju uh, in the game against the Dolphins where, you know, uh, didn't do a great job in the pocket and trying to throw over the top of Pouncey in that one. So, you know, uh, the big thing is you want out of a young quarterback is, hey, don't turn the football over, right? Now, obviously, the him, and we talked about this in the last podcast as well, too, got, got, got a grip onto that football when you take a sack. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's absolutely, especially when you're standing uh, in your own end zone. But he got blindsided on that one, and that was just you know poor pocket presence. And those are the two things I'm looking for, Rudolph, are improved pocket presence, because I've seen that regress over the last two weeks, and that's a little concerning. And then accuracy on some of the crossing routes over the middle. You know, that slant to James Washington you referenced was terribly behind, and Washington bailed him out by making a sensational one-handed grab. So those are the two areas I'm looking at for him. And you're right about the patience, but I know fans will say this, and it's true. You want to see progress too, and he's got to continue to show progress. And you're waiting for him to kind of have that signature game where there isn't this caveat of it was okay, but or you could have been better, but you know you want to make you want to see him have that true breakout game. It may not come this week against the Rams. I kind of think that it won't because the Rams secondary is fairly strong with it, the pieces that they've added over the last you know, 10 months, but um, maybe it comes against a a Jets team or a Cardinals team or whoever later on the schedule, but you do want to have that one signature game and hopefully that that comes up for him sometime uh, during the season. You know, it doesn't have to be 330 yards and and three touchdowns, you know, Uh, it just needs to be more of a complete game. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, yeah. look, I mean, his completion percentage is good, but I mean, his completion percentage should be good when you're <laughs> <laughs> checking it down. Yeah. When, when Half you, your completions go to running backs. So, right. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, it looks like he's seeing things properly most of the time. Uh, he looks a lot more comfortable. I, I, I think even sometimes in, in some of his cadences, I think he's, he's now varying his cadences up. Uh, good enough at certain points where he's getting the defense to show some things, you know, mm-hmm. little yeah. thing, little, little things like that. Uh, you know, going back, I, I tried to find a post. I mean, I, I charted every throw of his back uh, uh, and went through a lot of his or really all of his stats back from his Oklahoma State uh, uh, days. I think one of the main issues I worried about him coming out of Oklahoma State was his red zone. Uh, efficiency, if you will. I don't. Mm-hmm. I I, rem, I seem to remember that being troublesome in sh, in in the short area of the field. Uh, there. So I'll have to go back and find out, find the kind of find the specific things on that. But you know, I think he's he. I think he's well aware now that <laughs> NFL Open is different than college open, right? Uh, for, for sure. sure. Yeah, and, and and honestly, red zone play is one of the number one things I look at with college quarterbacks because that's the closest thing that resembles throwing in NFL windows is the college red zone because if you're between the 20s in college, I mean, everything is open, especially in a scheme like Oklahoma State that was designed for guys to get open. They had superior talent. Um, it was Life was pretty easy. 
between the 20s down there. So that that has been a concern. Obviously, the Steelers' red zone defense has been abysmal, and Tomlin was asked about that yesterday and just kind of joked it off and, you know, just kind of was like, guess. And obviously not having Ben is the biggest reason why the, the red zone offense has regressed so much. But you know, at the same point, this red zone offense can't be, you know, close to the bottom of the football, which it is right now, and this team, you know, not get any better and if this team wants to make a playoff push that red zone offense efficiency and success has to climb so that's that's the big number I'm going to focus on the third down offense has kind of straightened out they've been much better the last three games after just a, a horrendous start to the season even with Ben they were terrible on third down before he got hurt so um, a lot of work to do but again I keep seeing some tiny progression but the pocket presence for me is the number one thing I want to see Rudolph get straightened out because it hasn't been good enough the last two weeks yeah, and you, you know, it seems like he's kind of taken a little bit dip back since that since that <laughs> since mm-hmm. that injury, you know, yep. uh, in, in that area. Not that he was, you know, uh, uh, NFL high NFL caliber uh, prior to that. Uh, look, he's not a gunslinger, okay. Uh, but you know, we we've seen it, or or I saw him extend plays in college, you know. Uh, he's not going to be Ben Roth. Here's the, here's the bad thing that, that I think most fans are dealing with now, too. Man, he's not Ben Roethlisberger, and, and, and you, you can't even talk about the two in the, in, close in the same breath, you know, when it comes to to, uh, to to the way extended plays and just overall, you know. Uh, uh, nobody extends plays in the NFL like, like Ben, except maybe Russell Wilson and Aaron Rodgers, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, along those lines. But, uh, and I, I think the big thing that stuck out to me throughout this, this, this season as well, too, is it just seems like he's trying to be too damn perfect, you know? Right. Yeah, I know you said that a lot. I mean, just, just turn it loose, man. That, that, I think if he turns it loose to, uh, to Johnson, I, I still think Johnson has a chance to catch that. And if not, it just falls harmlessly incomplete at worst. Just throw it at his damn feet. And, and mm-hmm. make it in Aaron Rodgers, one of the best quarterbacks that, that uh, 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 puts the quarterback where either his guy's going to catch it or nobody catches it, whether it be high or low uh, in certain situations like that. He's got to learn that sometimes you got to trust these guys to make the play. Right. Yeah, we've, we've talked about that before with him, and hopefully that comes with time and more comfort and more experience you get. Um, I think you've seen some signs of that. I thought against Miami you saw signs of that with the tower re- rebounded uh, after the, the, the terrible first quarter that he had by letting Juju make plays, letting Deontay Johnson make plays, and kind of letting them go up and get it. So, yeah, I mean, there were certainly issues Sunday against the Colts, um, some stuff that he missed underneath. I don't think it was as bad as, as I thought, um, but you know, hopefully it gets better. I mean, make no, no no mistake about it. Uh, he's he's got some developing to do, and you know what what grade would you put on what letter grade would you put on him right now? I don't know. I haven't. Even, I don't even want to think about that stuff because I've said I want to take the season as a whole, and I don't want to put grades now because okay. I know they're going to no, change later. And it's just I, I get what you're saying, but I, I think we talk in absolutes. And I know you're not asking me to give an absolute, but I think we kind of talk about in, in finality sometimes too much. You know, league wide, especially. You know, I cited Baker Mayfield and Dak Prescott and Kirk Cousins, the roller coaster, the media and fans ride on how well those guys are or aren't performing. So it, it, it's been. There's been some encouraging signs, but a long ways to go. I think that's pretty obvious to, to anyone who's watching them. I mean, if he if he if he had completed you know five more deep down the field throws at this point, I, I'm not sure what the conversation would be ha- we'd be having on him right now. You know, sure, but he didn't he didn't complete those right. five. You know, I mean that's that's the NFL. Either you do or you don't. Right, and yeah, we are looking for that that that. That uh, put it together game, if you will, mm-hmm. and once again, you he can throw for 240 yards, you know, and it be wow, what a game, you know. Right. Although I am, I, I know what you're saying, you know, the box score won't tell you everything, but it would be nice to have that 300 yard, three touchdown, no pick, no sack kind of game where it just feels like everything's clicking. Boy, if he got it this week against the Rams, that'd be something. Yeah, yeah. Like I said earlier, I'm not holding my breath. This will be the yeah. week, but I'm hoping it comes at Oof. some point. If it comes this week, then all the merrier. Boy, if he if he has, uh, and yeah, I'm with you. Boy, you look, uh, Aaron Donald. Uh, they're gonna get Clay Matthews. It sounds like back mm-hmm. this week, and 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 they're gonna get, and they have Aaron Donald, and they got Jalen Ramsey, and they have Aaron Donald, <laughs> and. <laughs> <laughs> you see, they have Eric Weddle and they have Aaron Donald. <laughs> you you yeah. know where I'm going on that. So, uh, 
yeah, they're going to have to be able to show that they can run the football at least a little bit uh, in this game to take some of the pressure off. Um, mm-hmm. and we might see more check down Charlie, Charlie Rudolph in this one as well, too. Yep, so fire up Jalen Samuels in those PPR fantasy leagues you got, Dave, because he'll uh, he'll get you some points. Uh, I want to switch to the defense here briefly because we, we touched on it earlier in the show about Sean Davis and the dime defense. And I got my wish, Dave. A couple weeks ago I asked the Steelers about kind of a logical step was when they do go dime, and they've used dime defense a lot less this year, which makes sense because they're stronger at inside linebacker uh, this year as opposed to last. But you got to get Cam Kelly off the field. Your dime defense should have your best players, and your best players in that moment are Cam Sutton and Mike Hilton. And that's what the team did for three plays against the Colts on Sunday. When they went dime defense for just those three plays, it was Mike Hilton in the slot and Sutton playing that traditional kind of dime rover-ish type role. And I know it's a minor thing, but it's a big point. Those are your best players out there. Again, I'm not, I don't want to see Kim Kelly in any you know capacity on defense if I can help it. And I think just, you know, because in the past they were putting Sutton out there, which was fine, but they were removing Mike Hilton off the field entirely. And that just didn't seem to make sense to me to remove a better player uh, to put a worse one on in Cam Kelly versus Mike Hilton. So I think a logical adjustment, but a much needed one, then that's better off for the Steelers' dime defense to have Hilton and Sutton on the field. And obviously if they get Sean Davis back later on in the season, you can play around with him a little mm-hmm. bit in certain situations uh, you know, as well. But that that's obviously yet to be seen. Uh Disappointed in that red zone defense. We talked about it again, uh, or talked about it uh, on, on the show the other day. Man, you got to if you come away with with one more fail, one more fail there by the opposing offense, you're looking a lot better in the game. And, and maybe mm-hmm. it doesn't come down to what it came down to with with with, with a venetary kick kick there. Uh, we talked a little bit, wanting to say, well, what happened on that one with uh, with. Uh, uh, touchdown to Charles Rogers there. I think y'all 22 tells you the blame is on one of two people, uh, Mark Barron and, or Joe Hayden. And God bless Eric Ebron for helping those two kind of work out their issues. Oh, I don't know if helping is the right word, but uh, yeah, that was Barron and Hayden not on the same page on that play. It left the receiver open. I'm not sure who it's on. You know, it was uh, Someone thought they were banjoing it and passing it off, and somebody thought that they weren't, and it just it, it became a mess. So yeah, you're going to have communication issues in the red zone. Uh, teams are going to make you pay. I don't care who's the quarterback. I don't care who the receiver is. You do that down there in the NFL, uh, you're going to lose. You get, And I got to admit, I've looked at that thing 20 times. And yeah, you can have some certain principles and, and, and defenses that make you say, all right, uh, you know, that's that's that that that's probably on this guy or that guy. I don't think we're, we're we really know, you know. I, I think we're playing a guessing game on that. Uh, for what it's worth, which probably isn't much, Pro Football Focus tabbed Hayden with that. It seems like that you know there might have been a banjo call there that Hayden maybe didn't get. But I'm guessing there. Yeah, I mean, it's so hard. It's hard enough to know what happened on places that went right as opposed to when they go wrong and when there's specifically communication breakdowns. My initial thought was that it might be on Barron because if we're talking coverage, I kind of trust Hayden to know what's going on better in a banjo-type situation than, than Barron. But Barron is the communicator, so I, I, I don't know. I wish I could tell you. I, I couldn't tell you who that's on. Yeah, I don't know if we're going we're gonna to find out either. Now, I think probably Minka probably could have done a little better job maybe, you know, helping over on that side. But, I mean, he did have – I mean, it did, it did take a nice ball right over his head there. Mm, I thought Hoyer played really well in the red zone. Even that touchdown to Pasquale on the left side against Mike Hilton, that was a really well-thrown ball on the money high – where only his guy could get it. So, I mean, Steelers, you know, obviously communication issues, you don't give yourself much of a chance, but I thought Hoyer did a nice job in the red zone too, coming off the bench and, and, and playing strong. Yeah, and I know everybody listening to the podcast uh, right now probably saying, you got to blame Barron on that other one. You know, and I know mm-hmm. that. I know that's easy to do. I know he's not. I mean, he's obviously had his – look, they've had mistakes when he's on the field. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they keep playing. They keep putting the green dot on him. You know, so – you got to get that cleaned up, and and once again, you you look at the body language, and you look at the hand gestures, and then you I mean you look at even Eric Ebron, you know, and his kind of uh, one of the two made a mistake, and I wish I would I could positively ID it for you, but I I, I just I can't, you know, because mm-hmm. there there could have been a call in there or something, you know. Right, right. Um, what what other impressions from the defense did you get going back to this tape? <laughs> uh. Cam Hayward, not a sack guy. Uh, 
man, uh, he beasted Quentin uh, Nelson. Man, he did. He was he was all over him. You know, had a little bit of a one arm st- on that on that Brissett injury. The the play that Brissett was injured on. I was able to freeze that thing perfectly. Uh, he he rocked uh, he rocked uh, 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 Nelson uh, off his feet with kind of that one arm you know stab, and then just finished him off there, uh, put him down. And that, and that wasn't the only play. Obviously, uh, he he had uh, he had he had Quentin Nelson on skates quite a bit in that game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I I was really excited about this matchup. That was the one I'm circling or did circle the way I'm going to circle. You know, they have David Castro and, and Pouncey versus Aaron Donald this week, and I I didn't know how the battle was going to go. I figured Hagel was going to make a player or two. I figured Nelson was going to make a player or two, and it'd be kind of even. But I thought just top to bottom, Hayward won that battle pretty convincingly, and reminded you why he he's so good and been so good at a high level for for a long time now and uh kind of a welcome I don't know, maybe maybe not a welcome to the NFL moment for Nelson cuz he's in his second year but um just just a realization that of how good Hayward is and he can obviously take advantage of bad matchups he played some bad offensive lines this year and then against Cincinnati for example and been able to beat up on on young rookie guards the way that he, he dominated Michael Jordan back in uh, early in the season but uh, he really took Nelson to school on Sunday I don't know what Bud Dupree's eating, but I hope he keeps on eating it. Yeah, yeah give me give me seconds of that. Uh, yeah, he was named defensive AFC Defensive Player of the Week for the two sack performance that he had. But uh, I know you posted the the gif of it that third down stop, that third and one uh, that set up the Finitary field goal. I mean, just a massive, massive play. As good as Bud Dupree's Dupree's pass rush has been, and it's been excellent. His run defense has been even better. Yes, it has, and you've been a champion of that that aspect of his game for quite a while. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, I mean, the efforts are there, the hand use is there, and again, I think what is to me, and I and we talked about this briefly, but but to me, the biggest reason why he's playing better is because of health. Do you think that's the reason why? Do you think it's the contract? Do you think it's Butler? I mean, and I'm sure it's all those things, but if you had to pick out one aspect of it that would rise above all others, what would it be? Look, I, I don't know how. Obviously, I don't know how much health uh, had had to play in it, but I mean, we're seeing him do things that. I mean, at least show us some speed to power attempts. If you're not, you know, he's mm-hmm. he's showing us things that we just haven't seen out of him. I mean, even going back to his college days, Alex. Right. You know. Uh, and, and you knew in college he was raw because he didn't even have an outside linebackers coach back at Kentucky. But you figured it would translate once he got in the NFL and got the the dedication and experience and, and the proper coaching. But yeah, I, I think it's the speed, the power, but also just his hand use in general. It just feels like there's more range of motion, more that he can do, more than he can offer. And if you have a torn pec, it's kind of hard to have you know a range of motion. It's hard to really use your hands too well. So I think just his hand use overall, even on some of these speed rushes or swipes and and, and to win the edge, um, not even just true converting speed to power. So I think just playing healthy and just having a full full use of your body, full use of your hands, I think that's been critical for him. You know, when you look at that, uh, was it the strip? Uh, yeah, it was the, uh, the the strip sack of his. The TV angle, you can't really see it. It looks more like, I guess, more like a hand swipe or, or, or whatnot. But when you look at the end zone view on that, that was a tiny push-pull there. Yeah, I just he's initiating contact early. He's now the one initiating contact. Because in the past he would all he would never initiate contact. He would always be the one trying to avoid contact, and he get you know ridden up the arc too often. So now that he's able to play more physical, play more aggressive, and a more attacking style. He's putting himself in control of the rushes as opposed to the other way around. I wish I could put my finger on it and bottle it because uh, you know once again I, I don't know I, I'm not going to pretend to know how much uh, in you know health play played a role in it. But man, he looks like a totally different player. I mean, mm-hmm. it wasn't too terribly long ago. I think you were you were pointing out some of the differences in the post about him running up the arc and running himself right right out of plays and not initiating you know a lot of contact there. You had to think the coaches were on him about that, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm sure. But... Uh, so that makes me want to mean, okay, I, I get it. You 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 know you you, you have a shoulder or what what not you know issues there, but. Uh, Man, you at least uh, show more, show more what things he's showing now in, in those previous years. I I don't get it, but it's one of the biggest turnarounds. Normally, you don't see a guy, uh, you know, this late along come along like that. Right. Yeah. I mean, I know everyone's going to say it's a contract year, and again, we, we talked about this briefly Monday that it, it's obviously a factor, and he's talked about how he knows 
how much, you know, his future is at stake based on how well he plays this year. But you're not going quiet for four years the way that he did then turning on the fifth year just because it's a contract. You'd still be playing well in year four to try to get a long-term deal or make sure they picked up that option or whatever the case is or just the fact you want to play well and that was your job to do um, and you want to be successful. So it's not just, oh, okay, there's a chance for money, so now I'm going to decide to play well. It's that that's too simplistic and, and, and not realistic because Dupree's played hurt and played tough and um you know gone through gone through the ringer so this isn't a guy that's just wants money he wants to to play well and I think him being healthy this year he has not been healthy the last two seasons has barely been healthy throughout his entire career to be honest um so I think him being good to go this year and and feeling good is the biggest reason why he's 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 playing uh so much better than, than he has in the past and once again let me put a ball around it I I do think he's gonna get paid and can the, can can the Steelers afford him? As I said, you can massage the cap to do whatever you <clears throat> whatever you want. You know, for the most part. Uh, how much do you want to maybe kick the can down the road? And do you want to maybe part with a a, a, a different a, you know another veteran player or two outside of the ones that we already are expecting to be gone to maybe afford you know a, a, a you know a guy like that? So. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, what, what are you going to do with Juju? What are you going to do with James Conner? What are you going to do with Cameron Hayward's contract? What are you going to do with Alejandro Villanueva's contract? Uh, you know, what are you, what are you going to do with BJ Finn? You know, there, there's a, there's a lot of variables and with personally, I think still the only way you go about retaining Bud Dupree, the first part of that starts with using the franchise tag. Mm hmm. Yeah, we'll see. It's becoming an increasingly difficult decision. Well, we're we're going to be talking about it now. I mean, assuming yeah. he stays healthy and and continues to play in like he like he is, we're going to be having this 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 discussion all the way up until February. Absolutely, um, uh, Dave. I want to ask you about one player on defense. We don't talk much about Trell Edmonds this year. How would you evaluate Edmonds' play? Uh, I mean, have you seen improvement from year one to year two, and just kind of where do you think he's at in his career? Uh, you know, the safety position is so hard. Uh, a lot of times to kind of focus in on. Uh, I'll tell you this: he's showing more. He's showing up more in a positive manner than than he than than he obviously did during his rookie season. You know, I highlighted that uh, that uh, that play that Watt made against the run mm-hmm. uh, in, in in that game with him kind of you know stacking and 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 flashing inside the hole on 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 that outside run there and getting off. If he doesn't, if 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 Watt is unable to get to Mac, uh, there Edmonds is getting to him. Yeah, he was screaming across the line. I mean, he literally was. I had to stop it because I couldn't pick up the number. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, boy, the uh, the pass breakup in the uh, end zone on the on the uh, two point play. That was huge. I think everyone. I forgot about that play until I went back to the tape. That was a that was a critical 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 play. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, that and the Cam Hayward block extra point, that that's a field goal right there. So, mm-hmm. uh, uh, yeah, absolutely, I- I- indeed. <clears throat> I mean, you're not going to the Pro Bowl this year. Right, yeah, my, my thought with, with Edmonds, and I've expressed this on Twitter, I think in my mailbag before on Steelers Depot, is that he's been steady and consistent, which is which is really positive, but also you do want to see more splash from him. He's only got one career takeaway um, in, was it, 24, 25 career starts that he's at right now. Now, the good thing is, is because you've added Minka Fitzpatrick, you can, you know, deal with Edmonds not being a playmaker because you, at least one of your safeties, Minka, is your playmaker. When it was Davis and Edmonds, neither of those guys were making big plays. It became a real big issue, especially with the corners dropping as many interceptions as they did in 2018. So now that you kind of have a yin, yin and yang of Troy and Clark-ish situation, I know that's not quite they're not quite there yet but you get what i'm saying where troy was the playmaker clark was the steady kind of presence um you can live with that but i do want to see edmonds create more big plays everyone else in this defense is eating and getting big plays right now edmonds is the one guy still with a, an empty plate so i want to see him be able to make that one big splash play along with the rest of this defense i think i think most of my concerns uh this year have been more about his play maybe against the run and 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 and, and overall tackling too i think he's had a couple of uh, you know, missed tackles in here. I wonder how many. Uh, how many does Josh have? Uh, have him down for? 
I can check. This is before the, not including the Colts game because we haven't gotten the missed tackles report. Remember that one against Seattle he had that was pretty unfortunate. Um, I think he had but, a couple against Cincinnati too. Yeah, Josh has him down for six this season prior to the Colts game. That sounds about right. Let uh, me see how many he had all of last year. Uh, if I can pull up uh, Josh's report from last year, Edmonds had 11 as a rookie. So about on the same pace. Yeah, you know, I think some of his uh, some of the some of the run fits maybe when he's down low, you know, maybe not there. Uh, I don't think he's stuck out really too egregious in pass coverage, has he? Except uh, what was the, the the Seattle game? The one, uh, on, the one yeah, on one. Yeah, with Metcalf. Yeah, yeah, he hasn't been tested a whole lot. They've obviously had defined roles where Edmonds is playing down the box as a true strong safety, and minka has been a true center fielder, so it's been more manageable. Edmonds has had to play in less space. Uh, it has been a, a little disappointing, though, because Edmonds had such a good training camp that I really thought he'd be taking a big leap this year um, and, and really come on scene. And I don't think he's quite been there. It's not been bad by any means, but he he hasn't taken the step that I thought he would the way that I felt and talked about it coming off of the trope. You know, you just hit on a good thing that it just uh, uh, triggered a thought in my head. And that's, uh, you know, Mike Tomlin talking, obviously, like he does every year ahead of the season about second year players. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you feel the the prime group of second year players is playing this year? Uh, Edmonds is obviously one of them. James Washington is another one of them. Jalen Samuels is another one of them. I think they've all shown progress, which is what you want to see out of any player, obviously, especially the second year guy, because Tomlin's talked about how critical it is. I think Edmonds has gotten better. I think Washington has gotten better. I think he's playing his best football right now. Samuels has lost some weight, and he's been he's been dealing with a knee injury, so he missed some time there. And maybe I haven't seen him take a big, big step, but he has gotten more explosive. I thought it, but he's basically the same guy that he was last year. You know, a decent runner, but but a good quality, reliable receiver. Um, who else am I missing from that draft class? I'm trying to scan it as well, too. It feels like I'm missing somebody. Uh, somebody here. here. <clears throat> huh? uh, well, what do you think about Washington and Edmonds and saying, do you agree with that assessment on those three guys? I was glad to see the game Washington had this past week. I thought it mm-hmm. was, uh, I thought it, I thought it was more of that's the kind of guy that I thought the Steelers drafted. You still right. would like to see him win another time or two up over the top. Right. Sure. sure. Uh, but I mean, he doesn't have blazing speed. Uh, up until this past week, I mean, I, I think Washington had been a little, you know, had a little bit disappointing start to the season. Sure. Uh, but but I, also, I, I mean, he was he was the vertical threat in a dink and dunk offense, and that that was really hurt, hurting him. Right. Uh, who else? Well, I mean, Ru- well, yeah, the same was yeah. Rudolph, I'll go through it quickly. Rudolph, obviously, in his second year, but didn't play last year. Chuck Wumo core for I'll see a step back going from active to inactive. Marcus Allen uh, still in the practice squad. I call up Marcus Allen. I might dump Cam Kelly at this point and give me give me Marcus Allen. I know that Kelly can play free safety now and probably can't. And then Josh Frazier was was cut cut out right. Uh, let's see uh, the boy. Zach, Zach Banner going to make, I don't know, can he, tra- can he trade Chiquama to somebody for a, maybe get a, get a, get a fourth or something? It depends what Surratt thinks of him, but I, I try to hold on to my quality O-line depth as, as much as I can. Right. And he's cheap. And I'm, 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 I'm tongue in cheek there, you know, obviously, because I mean, you, you try to hold on to those cheap guys, but I think it's just, look, we, we came into this season thinking Chiquama or Corfor was going to be next man up. Mm-hmm. And, and that's obviously not the case. But uh, second year guys, uh, Washington. It was good to see that 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 game. Obviously, uh, Edmonds. I think there's progress there. Uh, boy, Sam. If uh, once again, I hate to keep going back to the to, to that deep ball to Holton down the side. But if Samuels, I sure would like to see uh, be a revisionist of history and see what happens if he picks up that blitz. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he he left the backfield, and that was my big thing with pass protection was that I thought he showed some one-two last year, but this guy just did not pass protect at all at NC State, so this is still pretty new to him. Okay, where else do we need to go here? Uh, well, I do want to offer the one stat on Edmonds, and I, I, I've kind of half done the research, but I have the, the name here. The Edmonds, again, has played—he's now started, what is it, 20, 
23 career games, and he's got one career takeaway. The last DB in football to have that many starts with that many takeaways, and this guy also recovered a fumble, but that's not a takeaway, I guess, in the sense of a forced fumble or a turnover created, was M.D. Jennings of the Packers back in 2011 to 2013. So Edmonds' kind of drought of, of, of lacking turnovers is, is pretty rare, and I really want to see that turnaround. Now, what was this from? Games played? Games started, I think, is what I have. Okay. Yeah, MD so, Jennings so regar- started. regardless of, of, of draft position and all like that? Yeah, regardless of draft position, just, just, just career starts versus career takeaways. Hmm. Okay. So it, but it's, it's one takeaway and, 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 you know, getting close to two seasons right now, almost two seasons worth of games. So, uh, you know, not that Emmons has been doing poorly. And again, having Minka really makes you feel better, and it's an easier pill to swallow when Minka's picking off anything thrown remotely in his direction. But I do want to see Emmons create more splash. Worst position group right now on the Steelers' defense? Mm, worst position group on the Steelers' defense. A very good question. There, there aren't any bad position groups for sure. I, I mean, my, my first thought went to some of the depth issues at, say, safety. But, I mean, the starters are, are, are solid. Um, and defensive line depth concerns. I don't know. I mean, there's really no bad group there. Obviously, it's the strength of the team. Um, Inside linebacker. Yeah, that's probably where – yeah, yeah. I'd probably go inside linebacker because I – Lack of other options, corner, maybe, because some of the little ups and downs of the, that group's experience, but that's typical. Yeah, sh- I'll shut up. Yeah, it's a linebacker's good answer. Uh, Devin Bush is making rookie mistakes. Barron's having a whole bunch of issues, and, you know, Vince, Vince is really just the same old Vince, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, which isn't a bad thing, but he's not taking his game to new heights either. You know, you, uh, I mean, you expect rookie and Devin Bush to have, have some growing pains. Uh, I mean, he's had some great games, obviously, right? I mean, a few, a uh, few nice games uh, uh, there, but you'd you'd like to see the Cobras start striking again, <laughs> as, mm-hmm. as uh, uh, Brian uh, Baldinger likes likes to call him there. Maybe this is the week where they where they start getting that stuff all together. Boy, you just wonder at what point can he start wearing the green dot here? You know, right. I, 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 get, the same. I guess yeah. not yet, huh? It, I just wonder how they're doing it because if it's Barron, Barron's not playing every down. None of these guys are playing every single down. So I don't. I wonder how they're communicating. How is that division of labor working? And you are there remember- are there two guys that have the green dot and they switch in and out? Can you do that? You can't have them on on the field at the same time. I know, but can you have two different helmets and you know one? I, I don't know. I mean, I really wonder how they do it. You know, and you go back to what the most confusing part about that too is. You know, Mike Tomlin talk about Mark Barron and him just not being really that vocal of a guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he called him a mute in training camp, and now he's wearing the green dot. So, and he's not out there every single play. So, in the plays where Barron's not out there, if he's wearing the green dot, who has the green dot? Is there a green dot? I mean, it's a whole who's on first situation. Behind the green dot, you're, you're not, that, you're not going to get that reference, but I think no. a, a, I think a lot of people. Is that maybe, a behind the music kind of no, thing? Behind the green door. Oh, uh, go, nope, no go, idea. Google behind the green door. Be careful. Uh, oh, oh, okay. Maybe I won't. But yeah, I, I just I just wonder how they're doing the divisional labor linebacker, and I wonder when they're going to have the confidence to let Bush do it because Bush is playing the most out of any of the inside linebackers, but he's still not playing every snap. But no one is, and I just I just wonder if it is a. I mean, they're going to go Watt. The where is it? I, I I really would love to be a fly on the wall. Yeah, and you wonder, uh, you know, how many? Yeah, they're just the, the two of them inside Bush and Barron are making too many mistakes. Yeah, and I will say with Bush, and I think I'm going to try to do a, a short write-up on it at some point before the week's done, is that he learned from his mistake on that Jack Doyle touchdown. Obviously, the touchdown he allowed was was poor technique, but he had a breakup on Doyle on a similar-looking concept later in the game uh, in the second half that I thought showed some improvement there. So at least he's not making the same mistake twice. Okay, good. So, uh, But that would be probably, the, I, I think, easily the, the, the – uh the worst position group on defense right now. Yeah, you're right. I don't know why I hemmed and hawed around it whenever you asked me. I think that is inside linebacker. Uh, anything else offense, defense you want to talk about from the All-22? Well, I'm trying to remember what uh, what what stuck out there. You know, I, I think we covered a good bit of it. I mean, Cameron Hayward flashing. Uh, no, not flashing, I mean dominating. Uh, you know, some missed tackles in that game. Obviously, the run defense we talked about uh, being – too leaky at times. Uh, I think the overall feeling on this thing too, and, and, and has been the case for several weeks now, is if the defense doesn't provide the offense good field position, oh well. Yeah. You know. uh, I, I have a, a question and a comment, but I'll start with the question. Isaiah Bugs. I've gotten two weeks under Isaiah Bugs. Played about twenty something snaps. Any any initial impression on him? 
I didn't zero in a lot on him, Alex. I got to be honest with you, but mm. but nothing that that made me want to trim a gif up on him either. <laughs> is that a, is that a phrase now? Trim a gif up on? I like yeah. that. Uh, yeah, trim, I'm with trimming you. Trimming the it, gifs. It, it, it's been it's been nondescript. There's been some stunt issues where I think he's learning how to basically run a stunt, and they've had guys kind of collide into each other. Some of the one on one matchups in the past game, he hasn't been too successful at the run game. It's been okay, not great. It's typical six round rookie stuff, and it's been a small sample size. But yeah, nothing nothing too big there. The one comment I wanted to make, and this goes special teams because that's right up my alley. With the kick return game that continues to struggle, twenty no, they're thirtieth in football and kick return average. Uh, I'm pretty sure coming off this week, and it, as much as people like to blame Switzer, and as easy as it is to just say, "Oh, Switzer sucks," and listen, he's not a dynamic guy. He's not playing well. If they cut him tomorrow, I'm not going to lose a whole lot uh, sleep about it. Though I recognize they trust him, and that's why he's still on this roster. But the blocking just continues to be a major issue, Dave. And I thought on both returns Sunday, and I broke this one down. Uh, or at least one of the plays out on Twitter was that Cam Kelly and Trey Edmonds both couldn't make their blocks on either of those failed kick returns. So um, it's really been a blocking issue. It's an operation issue. And I know we've talked about it time and time again, but uh, the blocking has to get better. Yes, indeed. So it's, it's been frustrating. And, and, and listen, there is definite blame to go on Danny Smith for this, because if you've, we've talked about these blocking issues for a while now and you've had different personnel, you've tried different schemes and formations and things like that. And it still hasn't gotten better. It's really gotten worse. And that does eventually reflect on coaching. I think I was watching a Monday night game the other night and a Giants player returned one to the midfield. Is that allowed? Mm-hmm. I don't think you can do that. <laughs> I don't know when they put that role in. So, but yeah, it's been... Uh, you know my feelings on now. I pray for touchbacks and 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 Switzer fair catches now. Mm-hmm. But teams are smart. They're kicking it short intentionally because they're just daring Pittsburgh to try to get to the twenty five and they can't do it. It makes you wonder that you know at, at some point here, and boy, the defense has been you know doing what they're supposed to do in, in the turnover category here. What's going to happen when they run when they have a game where you? Either, you know, let's say you get zero or one takeaway and maybe your one takeaway is deep in your own end uh, uh, there. What's, you know, can the offense uh, over, overcome this? Because quite honestly, if you look at their scoring drives so far this year, they're they're starting about damn near about midfield, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that that certainly does help not having that extra 30 yards to cover, you know, 20, 20 yards to cover there. Sure. So they have got to get, you know, I, I you know, I don't, I, you'll never hear me say that run pass balance needs to be X amount or, or you need to this or that and the other. But if you run successful early in games, it allows you to run. It usually allows you to run more later in games and hopefully you're running even more successful at that point. So they've got to find a way to to get five yards of carry on first down or at mm-hmm. the very minimum four, you know, because that, you know, technically a, a successful play on first and 10 is four and a half yards. OK, uh, I, I think most offensive coordinators will probably tell you four is acceptable, you know, mm-hmm. but uh, you got to have more run success in games to get yourself because Mike Tom will put it pretty, pretty blunt, right? Uh, and I think you were uh, immediately had this quote up on, on, on Twitter yesterday during the press conference here. If you get behind the chains against the Rams, you're what? You're in shark. You're, you're swimming in shark infested waters. Yep. And that's true. Aaron Donald's going to kind of go ahead and get after you. Uh, even as good as the Steel's offensive line is, they're going to get the, the Rams will get pressure. If you get yourself in third and forever, you are not you're expecting way too much if you put Mason Rudolph in second and eight and third and seven or more throughout the game. Mm-hmm. And Randy can't run it on second and 10. And no, no, that's, you know, that's a pet peeve of mm-hmm. mine. Oh, I know. Uh, I mean, I, I get it. I understand it some of the times, but it doesn't mean I like it. Yeah. Uh, second and long, you damn sure better get six yards on it. Easier said than done, though. Uh, I think you hit a lot of screen game early in this one. Try to get that D line running. Try to you know uh, tire them out a little bit, wear them down early, force them to sub. Maybe that gets you in third and five, where they have a backup lineman in that makes that a little easier to block up. I think you're gonna see some run game alternatives in this one as well, too. 
I think yeah. you got to. I, I think you got to focus on getting the ball out out of Mason Rudolph's hands quick. And if uh, I, I think you can bring bring some, uh, you know, obviously we haven't really seen a lot of RPO stuff uh, mm. this past week, right? Or and maybe the past, the last two couple weeks. weeks. Yeah. No, I haven't seen a lot of it. Maybe it's time to bring a little bit of that stuff uh, back against the Rams here. At least open up the option for for a quick wide receiver screen. I think. And I think it's imperative to get the ball in the hands of your players out in space as quickly as possible in this one. Yeah, I'm with you 100%. Uh, especially a guy like Juju, because it's going to be tough to get the ball to Juju downfield. Because Jalen Ramsey is going to be on him for maybe all the game, the entire game. So I uh, try to find ways to get him the ball early. And Eric Weddle is so damn smart about mixing up those coverages. And Wade Phillips is not afraid of, of, of pulling out. You know the whole sink and the mm-hmm. and the toilet and whatnot and throwing it at you. Yeah. The the, ki- knows- the, the kitchen toilet. He'll throw the kitchen toilet at you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows football better than Wade Phillips? Uh, I mean, there's nothing that uh, he he hasn't seen before. Nothing he can't combat. And he's gonna be facing a quarterback in his first year starting, and that's generally an advantage for the defensive coordinator. Boy, they had no issues just overturning that secondary, did they? They, they needed to. It wasn't good enough. And you get a chance to add Weddle and certainly trade for Jalen Ramsey. I don't blame him for it. Uh, that Littleton uh, in, inside, quite a little player, you know, quite a player there at linebacker. And once again, boy, you're going to get uh, Matthews was on fire before he got hurt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is scary. Yep. All right, Dave. Uh, anything else you want to talk about Steelers wise today? Anything all 22? I'm trying to think. I thought I had something else I wanted to mention, but it's not coming to mind right now. Anything from, from you? No, I think I think we we, uh, we we got most of it there. Let's see. I'll scan real quick and see if I missed anything on this as well too. I don't think we did. I uh, either uh, I guess Mason's going to talk either either today or tomorrow. Uh, I'd like somebody to ask him about that safety. How about you? Uh, yeah, I would. Though I I feel like we kind of have it well diagnosed at this point. I'm sure Rudolph's going to take the blame on him and say I can't you know I can't try to be indecisive there i can't back up my own end zone i gotta just get the ball out so i i mean i would like to hear it from him but uh i don't did, did he get asked about it after the game i don't remember if he was asked about no it no he the- no and i was i was kind of surprised about it. they asked him okay. about the, the the deep ball down the field to washington and asked about several other things but 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 the safety mm, okay well we'll see yeah hopefully he will get asked you know and, and bud dupree with him winning afc uh defensive player of the week has anybody come out, come right on out and ask him what's di- I mean, what's different? What he, you know, what he views his, you know, I, that's a question I think he needs to be asked. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would love to hear it from his perspective. No, I, I haven't seen him uh, answer it or be asked that question. Uh, you know, I, I'd, I'd come right out and say, Bud, look, I mean, you're you're having a great season here, and and you look like a totally different player. What has played a part in that? Mm-hmm. I would love to ask about the health, though, because, I, I mean, I, I know he doesn't like to talk about it a whole lot because he's been a tough guy and doesn't want to make an excuse for himself. But I would love to just be like, you know, dude, how healthy are you? Like, what happened last year? I know you were playing through something. Uh, let's see. What other questions will we like asked of, of, of some of these players? Oh. I, I, I would like Hayden to comment. I know they won't. But, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Hayden or Barron to comment on 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 that touchdown late in the game there. Mm-hmm. Right, I mean, I, I guess we're scraping. I think we hit it and all. And, and if you tune in, think we're going to get a beat writer today. Unfortunately, uh, something I don't know what it is about that, those LA guys too too good to come on podcast or whatnot. <laughs> uh, well, I don't want to say yes because then we will definitely won't get one for Friday. So we'll try to get a. We should be able to get a beat writer for Friday. Uh, hope hopefully we'll we'll. we'll we're going to have one uh, on, on Friday there. And I guess it works out kind of good because we haven't uh, looked at you know much of the Rams tape yet here. Mm-hmm. All right, let's uh, – shall we get to the email machine? Yep, let's do it. Uh, Tony writes in, hey, guys, my name is Tony. I wanted to highlight a play that people haven't been talking about but ended up being incredibly important. Terrell Edmonds made an excellent, excellent pass breakup on the two-point conversion attempt. <laughs> <laughs> he had uh, – look, Alex uh, hit on this not not long after the game on, on, on the Twitter machine there. Had the Colts converted uh, the game, could have been a complete – could, could have been completely different. This play should definitely be noted in into Edmund's development as a safety. Thanks for everything you do. Good eye, Tony, because uh, Alex and I just talked about that not too long ago. Yeah, and then you mentioned the extra point block, which was critical too. Steelers have three field goal slash extra point blocks the last three seasons, one in 2017, one in 2018, one in 2019. So they don't take that 
they don't take a kick for granted. They don't just assume, oh, okay, they're going to, especially an extra point. It's easy to take that play off. You're a defender. Hayward's been out there for the entire drive. You just want to get off the field, get a, some Gatorade, but uh, you play hard through every single snap, and that's what Hayward exemplifies. You never know how how big a difference one play maybe can make in a game. Mm-hmm. You just and don't I, know. To get on my Danny Smith train, that's coaching too. I mean, few goal blocks don't happen by accident. They're, they're coached. They're game plan for you. Learn about the, the angle of the kicker, what gap he kicks over. Is it the A gap, the B gap, based on the situation of where the kick's at and the kicker, kicker tendency. So those things are player executed, of course, and credit to Cam Hayward. But those things are game plan for and coached for as well. Was he going to miss that extra point anyway? I didn't even look at it in that I, I go look at the – I got that, I got a slow-mo of that on, on, on the yeah. Twitter machine. Okay. I'll look. Uh, looks kind of low and like it's it's going <laughs> going yeah, off to the left, you know. Vinatieri struggled this year, so that, that wouldn't surprise me if he would have. And I'm not trying to take anything away from Cameron Hayward, people. Okay. Uh, Andrew writes in, "Hi, Dave and Alex. Uh, in an episode behind on the podcast, but listening to the can't re-sign Hargrave and Dupree got me thinking. Let me clarify once again: it's not that they can't they they could <laughs> it could be tough. I mean. Uh, I don't. I don't think either one of us think that they're going to sign both of them, resign both of them. It's 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 just from a cap economics perspective, is why I'm saying they're unlikely to sign either of those those guys. Let me get that out of the way first. Would Butler possibly in his last year? What if the team shifts to to a more four three scheme over the traditional three four? To it and Hayward become defensive tackles, Watt defensive end, and all we need is another defensive end. Linebackers could be Williams, Barron, and Bush. Realize changing the schemes is usually a silly thought, but curious what you what you guys thought. Uh, I gotta be blunt here, Andrew. I don't have not given that any thought. Yeah, I'm not interested in changing schemes. Uh, the, the scheme's working pretty well right now. And also, Watt plays with his – actually, I, I looked at the stats here uh, the other day. Watt plays with his hand down basically as often as he plays with his hand up in pass rush situations. So, you know, he's, you can easily just kind of put your hand down and get in three-point stance. So he gets to have that kind of luxury of being able to fire off the ball from a defensive end look uh, as often as he does with his hand up, uh, standing up. Where I sit right now, Andrew, I don't see any kind of uh... – you know, four three shift. I mean, look, you yeah. playing so much sub package now, any anyways, right? Mm, it doesn't matter that much. Plus, we've been talking about the four three forever. It hasn't happened. I don't think it's it, it's going to change now. Uh, Daniel writes in. I've been really missing the snap count breakdowns every game, especially the special teams ones with UG three now and IR. I'd like to see how the special team snaps are doled out. Daniel, I apologize. We've had so much stuff going on with the site and all like that, and these these weeks these weeks get in the middle they get bogged down real quick so that's on me i'll try to put up a snap count uh from this past week's game up and and maybe something along with with the totals as well too at the midway point to give you something to look at i'll try to put that on my list to get up today so i that, i apologize on on that just you know we've had a, a few site issues and, and things you know kind, kind of getting away as well too uh jay smith writes in hey fellas i've been listening forever you guys do a great job i go by smitty 6788 on the site i want to chime in on on paying butt i've been a fan of his since we drafted him i've been waiting for a healthy season by him now that he's been healthy i think the front office should do what it takes to resign him if that means cutting foster baron restructuring ben so be it but still in his prime and with him and tj coming out coming off the edge this defense can be special for years to come uh, uh smitty we'll we'll see brother i mean once again, I think if, if if you're going to keep him, it starts with the franchise tag. I, I just I just do you see any possibility? Uh, I mean, what percentage chance, Alex, do you see of them signing Bud Dupree to a long-term contract extension before the tag deadline is due? When's the tag deadline due? Right there in March. I mean, February. Uh, uh, February to right up into March, I think, is the deadline. Early March. I mean, obviously, it's by the by the start of the new league year. Uh, I don't know. I still think there's ways to do it without having to put the tag on him. Um, I don't think that's a requirement, but I know that I haven't studied these these case situations uh, maybe as close, or definitely not as closely as you have. So I I, I I still think there's a path that you could try to work out a long term deal. If you offered him sixteen and a half million dollars in a long term deal. You know what's why? Why put the tag on him? Why even have to to do that? 
Well, I think there's the whole guaranteed money thing as well, too. You know, how well, much, sure. I'm just trying to give you just just an overall, you know, I'm just saying that you could do a long term deal without offering the tag. Just negotiate. Just 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 negotiate an offer that would be fair market value. I mean, I think they might try to negotiate with them. But once again, <laughs> I think and I think it's in Bud's best interest as well, too. Like I've said several times to a force the tag. Because that sets the market value instantly mm-hmm. there. And B, explore, you know, if they don't tag you, explore what's out there. Because right. maybe he can get the first couple of years fully guaranteed. He's not going to get that from the Steelers, right? Right, no. They're not going to fully guarantee the first couple of years. That's not how they operate. Right, so... But, but I, I, I don't think you have to force a tag to set the market value, because everyone knows what this market value is. And if the Steelers are smart, they don't have to play this game, because they don't have time on their side. And, you know, say, we know that you're worth more than what the tag is. So let's work out a long-term deal. Plus, I don't want to do the tag, because I don't want to be... Doing, doing this, you know, my cap space totally committed to that sixteen million dollars for for one guy and for one year. Um, just negotiate, you no. Know? And if you can't get it done, you can't get it done. He gets to the free agency and and you see what happens then. But I think you just negotiate it and, and see if you can get a, a deal done long term. Yeah, I mean, we'll 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 see. I, I I don't think there's any way around the tag initially okay. here, but uh, we'll, I mean, we'll we'll see how this plays out here. Uh, do, you, got... do you think they do you think they tag him even if they don't ultimately end up? Being able to do a long-term deal, or you, like, how do you think that that would work? If well, they I mean, I, I don't know how they're thinking about trying to kick the can down the road here in some certain yeah. situation. I don't know truly what they think about Ramon Foster right now. Uh, I don't, I truly don't know, you know, what they think about uh, uh, Tyson Alulu. Uh, I don't know what they think about Vince Williams. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know what they think about possibly getting. Uh, Connor a new contract. Yeah. I mean, here we are halfway point of season, and you know, I try to lie, I try to lay this out the best I can as far as a projection out. But we're we're half a season away. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, so much can, uh, so many things can change between now and then. I mean, uh, the things that I think are, are probably, you know, I don't want to talk in absolutes here, but a, a to it restructure. Would you cut to it? I mean, you still, no, I mean, no. you, uh, uh, you know, I know some people are going to say, well, you can't stay healthy. Cut them, you know, no, you're not, you're not cutting to it. I mean, uh, restructure. I mean, re, but restructure doesn't all restructure doesn't mean he makes less. No, I mean, it doesn't. He doesn't make less. You're kicking the can down the road. I don't right. know how it works, but uh, I'm just saying free up the money, but you're not cutting to it. You know, I mean, do you want to make uh, Ben Roethlisberger have a 40 something million dollar cap hit in 2021? Right. No, I understand. Yeah, like I said, there's no guarantee that Dupree gets kept, but I think you just negotiate it out, and if you get a deal that works, then you do it, and if not, he gets free agency, then you say, hey, you tried, you tried to do a deal, and it just didn't work out. All right, uh, we're going to have these conversations like mm-hmm. that forever. A uh, <laughs> couple of questions from Jeff. Here are a couple of questions I'd love to hear discussed today. Why don't the Steelers run more play action with Mason? I think it'd be very effective. What has been the Steelers' run percent versus pass on first down the last the past couple of games. I feel like I keep saying stop running every first down. It feels so predictable. Uh, the last two games, can we pull that up real quick? First down, uh, first down, uh, first down, I guess let's let's uh, let's look at first and 10. Uh, first and ten plays. Can you can you pull that up real quick here? On for the for last, what the, the Steelers the last offense? last two games, yeah. Steelers offense. Okay. Last we don't have the Colts chart, so yeah. But just uh, uh, what what game was that for the Steelers this past week? Week uh, that was game. This would be game seven and game eight, and it would be first down and. 10 yards. Sorry, we're having to do this on the fly. Yeah. They, they, I'll, I'll vamp here. I mean, they have used play action, I think, more, I would say, the last two weeks. And they've used pistol still some on five or 10 plays, I think, the last two games. Uh, that helps, you know, give you the option of play action with a more downhill and more varied run style. So uh, I would imagine that things look a little bit better the last two weeks with, with Rudolph and play action and things like that, as opposed to certainly any time under Ben or, you know, early in the year with Rudolph. All right, it looks like first in, and these are first and 10 runs only over the course of the last two weeks. Uh, against the Colts, 10 pass, 12 rush. That's pretty balanced. Mm-hmm. Uh, Miami, though, 6 pass, 12. 19 rushes. Okay, well, getting so, the lead in so that one. 16 passes, 31 
rushes on first and 10 over the course of the last. Uh, now, they, they, they had that concerted effort kind of against the Dolphins to kind of mm-hmm. power run that thing. Yeah, and they were running pretty well. Uh, not not as a whole, but we'll save that for another podcast. <laughs> they ran oh, yeah. good at times. Yeah. They ran, sure. they ran better than they ran against the Colts. Let's put it to you that way. Okay. Uh, let's see. What else do we have here? To it versus Dupree. Uh-oh. This is from Chris in Connecticut. Uh, great article about next year's salary cap. Dave says the Steelers say the Steelers signed Dupree. Most likely the Steelers can only fit the cap charge of Dupree or to it next year. They're, they are both immensely talented and have burst of dominance, but also deal with uh, many injuries, which affects performance and or availability. Hypothetically, let's assume cap charge could be relatively even. Who would you consider to keep who if you could keep only only choose keep one next year? Who Who would it be? Again, you're not cutting to it to sign Dupree. That's generally not how the Steelers operate. So it's not like to its contracts up and you got to make a choice. You know, to it's going to be on the roster next year. He wants you to make a choice. That would turn to it. I mean, because to it's not getting cut. All right, to it. Uh, Anthony Morgan writes in. Pro Football Focus ranked Minka 93.3 grade. When you and Alex went back and watched the All-22, do you agree with their assessment? Uh, if uh, I don't, I still to this day don't know completely how they grade players. I think I've got a pretty good idea of how they kind of balance it all out, uh, Anthony. But even so, I I don't have their official. I mean, we've seen some of their grading, you know, things. I think uh, that they hand to their charters and all. I don't know how much that's changed or whatnot uh, over the years either. I mean. He graded out well. I mean, the the, the, cup, the couple of plays, the touchdowns that I have questions on, I have less questions on after going back on the all-22. Uh, I mean, how much weight do you put on a pick six? Uh, a lot of it, I guess. I mean, I don't, again, I don't know how they, they weight things, like you said. Uh, his tackling, too, hasn't been bad. He's not obviously a physical super impact tackler, but he's solid, and his angles are good, too. So I want to tip of the cap to, to his tackling as well. He's had a couple of nice, uh, what we would call uh, run or, or, or play fails, you know, where mm-hmm. uh, causing an offensive play to not gain. You know, you talk about successful play. He's, he's been on a couple of those this year, so that's good. Uh, here's a good one for you, Alex. Todd Jitzler writes in, do the Steelers have a quarterback coach? If not, they need to get one right away. Ben had one for many years, even after winning two Super Bowls. Well, Randy Feetner is technically, I mean, he's listed as the, the quarterback coach. Um, so short answer is yes. And then the other guy uh, that most people don't know about, but I hear mentioned all the time in that locker room, I think Mason Rudolph just talked about it, I believe, last week before the Colts game is Matt Sims, who they hired as a grad assistant. I think he was at South Carolina that's had a pretty big impact that, you know, Sims worked with the quarterback exclusively at South Carolina and is doing the same. Uh, he's listed as just, I think, an assistant right now, but he really works solely with the quarterbacks the way that Sean Surratt was solely an O-line assistant back whenever he was the assistant to Munchak, even though the Steelers listed him as just a pure assistant coach. So short answer, um, yeah, Feetner and then Sims. Uh, should they hire somebody more dedicated? If they do, they might just promote Sims to quarterback coach. I don't have any issue with what they're doing right now in the quarterback room. Yeah, I think they've handled it well for as difficult as this situation has been. And Randy was a quarterback coach for how long? A long time. He did it at what Memphis, I think, or was he at Memphis? I mean, was he was the OC. Was he quarterback? I think he did both. I think it was passing game. What he passing games or, uh-huh. or I don't know. Run. I don't forget what. what hey, I mean, the guy's coached quarterbacks. You know, he's coached Ben. He's coached. Oh, he's coaching Rudolph right now and Dobbs and in college. Who were the Memphis quarterbacks back in the? Oh, you know, I wrote a whole article about that way back. Uh, that guy that he has, he turned that one kid around there. Uh, but I can't remember his name. I had to go back and look at, I, at, at I, some of that. I know at uh, Arkansas State, he had, and I've said this before, he had Cleo Lemon. I remember Cleo Lemon, former Dolphins quarterback, uh, had him Arkansas State way back when. Oh, you're going to make me. I know, I'm looking it up too. I'm, I'm, I'm clocking uh, away now. But, but did this guy go at, to the NFL, or did he just have a good college career? No, I think he just had a, had a uh, good good quarterback. I mean, a, a good college uh, career there. Uh, Danny Wim, Danny Wimprime. That's that that maybe that sounds one? like it. Uh, Danny, let me see if that pulls anything up here. Uh, clicking the wrong buttons. 
But when Prime was the starter in 04, I think that was Feetner's last year. When did Feetner get? I think Feetner got hired in no 07 was Feetner getting hired. I think right. All right, I think I think I found it here. The year before. Feetner arrived back at Memphis. The Tigers averaged 16 points a game and had a 2.6. Let's see. Fittner turned that around quickly in his first season as offensive coordinator and did so by using quarterback Danny Wimprine. You got it. Did you did you Google that? And that, that you didn't have Danny Wimprine in your head, did you? Oh no, I'm looking it up right now. No, I, that is not okay. something I had at all. Uh, if you did, good good, good on you, <laughs> Danny I'm Wimprine. Had that in my repertoire. A 2,000 red-shirted freshman. The Tigers' offense increased over 10 points per game to 26.7 in 2001. Three quarterbacks on that team combined to put up uh, a more respectable 6.6 yards per attempt, and they were intercepted just six times on the season uh, uh, in there. Boy, I haven't I haven't looked at this post in. I wrote this post <laughs> back in 2012. Wow. Those were the days. Uh, I'm trying to see what else. Uh, uh, Wimprine rushed just uh, just 40 times in 2003 and completed 246 passes for. Well, I'm quite a knowledgeable researching dude, ain't I? Uh, mm-hmm. Overall okay. passing stats for the Tigers in 2003 show a 7.3 yards per attempt to go along with a 13.2 yards per catch number. The third. Convert, third down conversion percentage jump to 40% and the run pass ratio, although not 100% accurate, was 51 and 49. Basically, the offense was very balanced and very effective. Wim Prime became the first Tiger quarterback to throw for more than 3,000 yards in a single season in 2003. His second full season as a starter, the Tigers went 9 and 4 that season, and Wim Prime was named MVP of the 2003 New Orleans Bowl. Hmm. How about that? Danny Wimprine didn't expect to be talking about him today. Boy, I haven't looked at that post. Thanks for taking me down the rabbit hole there. Uh, all right, uh, from Seth writes in, currently listening to the discussion on, on the Dupree contract. Thanks for all the great insight. I wish I could remember stuff like I just rattled off. I, I just, I need, I need about four more brains. <laughs> uh, thanks for all, and, and, and a little less past drug usage. Thanks for all the great insights. I've always believed that the NFL executes the salary cap in such a way that punishes teams for drafting well. Especially if you're already a winning team and find gems at the bottom of the draft. If you're already competitive, then draft guys like what Juju Connor and Hargrave, who all need to get paid. Of course, you're not going to have cap trouble and might uh, and might have to let guys go. Of course, you're going to have cap trouble and might have to let guys go, even though you drafted them. Seems to me like the cap makes more sense in the context of free agency. Can you envision a world in which the NFL someday softens the cap and allows teams relief for giving market value to the players they drafted without having to cut guys, let guys walk or restructure veterans? Question mark or am I dreaming? Yeah, the NFLPA uh, would love to have. Uh, <laughs> free for alls, wouldn't they? Well, I guess if they if they have a soft cap like the NBA, it'd be less active in free agency because more guys would end up staying with their current team. Is that what he's saying? Uh, I, I don't I don't correctly? know what you just said, but uh, but what he's suggesting a soft cap for the NFL. Is that what he said? I don't even know what that really means. Well, isn't that is that the phrase that he used? Basically, that you can go over the salary because like in the NBA, you can go over your salary cap. To keep your own players, I haven't. I haven't really even studied that, Alex. To okay. be honest with you, yeah, it, it's an interesting idea though, because I understand. I think. I think the point he's trying to say is that you you get all these good players. You have Watt and Juju, and you, if you find a gem in there, you got James Conner, and you can't keep all those guys when their contracts expire because they're all too expensive. So you got to lose some guys to free agency, so it punishes you for finding talent in the draft. So I think the idea would be. Like in the NBA that has bird rights, where if you have a player for three more years, you can go over your salary cap to be able to retain that player. That, that'd be an interesting approach. Um, I'm, I'm not a, totally opposed to that idea, though I don't think it's ever going to happen in the, in the NFL, or at least will not happen anytime soon. Yeah, but when you put so much uh, – I mean, look, I, 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 there should be uh, a good deal of focus on the draft. And, and drafting smartly and all, but how would a team that's behind the eight ball with bad drafting and 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 bad management and decide to make a change? How how do they ever recover in that in a two to three year period? Yeah, that that's a fair counterpoint. But I guess his argument would be, well, that's on the organization for doing a bad job, and they get punished for being bad, and good teams get 
rewarded for, for playing well. I'm not saying I agree with it. That's just I think that the point he's trying to make, if I'm interpreting that correctly. Yeah, but if those bad teams never have a chance to sign players, some good players during free agency, will they ever be competitive? Sure. No, there, there's a, the NBA has obviously some competitive balance issues with you know the kind of the good teams that are always the same, and, and, and that's a fair point, and that's probably a good argument against uh, the idea that's being suggested here. The way I look at it, Seth, is it's uh, it's sins of the franchise quarterback, if you will. In other words, and I think I think I, personally, and it's a bias here I, uh, because I've dealt with the system that they have and know it inside and out. I like what they do right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I mean, look, go, the quarterback is such a key position on any team, right? I mean, are you going to win? Uh, you can win it all without a uh, uh, top name quarterback, but name name to me the quarterback said that have won the last mm-hmm. twenty Super Bowls. I mean, it's probably fairly easy to do if I put you know put a gun to your head, right? You yeah, know? I mean, how many bad quarterbacks have won Super Bowls? Trent Dilfer, Joe That's Flacco. Does point. Joe Flacco can I fit Joe Flacco in there? Uh, I don't know. If he was, he's obviously not Brady or Manning. I don't know if he was at Dilfer's level whenever he won the Super Bowl. So if you have a franchise quarterback and you keep paying him, shouldn't you have to pay for that on the back end? Yeah. Well, I know some people have suggested the idea of having almost, and I don't know the entire mechanism of it, but a separate cap for a quarterback and have that separate from your other team cap. Are you in favor of that? I'm guessing you're not. No, no. I I, I personally, I'm okay with the sins of the franchise quarterback because I'd much rather watch the Steelers play with a franchise quarterback. Is there any worry, though, that the way the quarterback salaries keep getting bloated, that they're outpacing the inflation of the overall salary cap, and that's going to be a problem 10 years from now? I don't think so. No? I, I don't think so. I think the way I, I, I think the way it continues to the, the revenue sharing and the TV deals and 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 all like that. No, I, I, I don't see that as an issue. Look, well, I, I, I guess I don't know, but it, are quarterback salaries going up? At a higher rate than the overall salary cap, I guess. Uh, I, 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 I yeah, I that. haven't studied that. You know, that'd be a great question for Joel Corey next time we mm-hmm. have him on. Write that one down somewhere in your in your book book. All right. Uh, because I, you know, I I just I haven't looked at that, Alex. Yeah. Because uh, if if it is, if quarterback salaries are going up at a higher rate than the overall cap, then I think that will be an issue where eventually quarterbacks are going to continue to to be a larger and larger percentage of the overall cap, and that's going to really start to hamstring some teams. All right, uh, here's here's one at Nate, and Nate Nate takes a pretty good shot at me in the second part of this one, so I, I could easily avoid this one, so I'm I'm, I'm not okay. Uh, first question I hear on various NFL podcasts, like the Around the NFL podcast, that Mason Rudolph is awful, and they think Devlin Hodges is better. I'm not saying this, but they are. Do you think it's just because Mason was a third round pick and the Steelers want him to be the guy, or do you think they truly believe he is better? Wait, he's asking, do I think the Steelers believe that do Mason Rudolph is better Do you think it's just because Mason was a third-round pick and the Steelers want him to be the guy, or do you think they truly believe he is better than Doug? No, I think they, they, they truly believe that he's better. Uh, no doubt in my mind about it. Not knowing around what the Around the NFL uh, podcast has said about Mason Rudolph, it, I, and, and they think Devlin Hodges is better, I, I have not listened to that, so... I mean, look, I mean, I, I, I don't know what you want the team. To, I know someone will say, put put Devlin. What, what would be the first response you give to someone to say, I truly believe Devlin Hodges should be the Steelers quarterback right now? What would my response to that be? Yeah. That just you're being too reactionary that it, it's easy to look at the backup and everyone loves the backup because he hasn't had to do a whole lot. Uh, if you give Doug Hodges five games, you're probably going to talk about the same issues Mason Rudolph's having right now. Or worse. Or worse. Yeah, probably worse. I mean, again, I like Duck. I've been a big Duck fan. I talked about him in camp. I think I was one of the first guys to talk about how well Hodges was doing in camp. And I've kind of been on that bandwagon for a while now. But I recognize is that, you know, the the grass is not always green on the other side. Look, we, we're going to continue to monitor this, and it's going to get redundant. But we're going to keep telling you people until the end of the season, let's let's – you know, let's not make reactionary things from one game to the next. Let's look for some of the things that he needs to work on and see if he improves, and then let let Alex and I put all this in the blender at the end, and 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 tell you what we think about him. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and again, we had this conversation with, with uh, Rudolph. As soon as Ben went down, everyone, well, what if Rudolph plays well? Is Ben going to lose his spot? Now that Rudolph's in, oh, it's, it's hard to play well. Can he take Rudolph's spot? It's just uh, it's something fans always say whenever there's a backup quarterback situation. All right, here we go. You ready for Dave to get blasted here? Uh, you don't have to read it. It's it's all right. We Dave, can... you can be funny and a smart guy, but when someone disagrees with you, why do you have to always be lazy and just insult them? It's a terrible way to talk to people. You even talk to Alex this way, like telling him he has a comprehension problem on the Bud Dupree contract issue. I believe you were misunderstanding what he was saying. You got to be nicer, Dave. All right. So uh, there you go. Uh, look, I, for those who don't know, I'm mania bipolar. That's not an excuse. It's just what I am. Uh, at least a lot of passive aggressiveness. As people have picked on, a lot of people don't like me. Okay. Uh, hopefully Alex uh, still likes me. Uh, I apologize. I, I, I apologize to him earlier in the podcast. It's probably not going to be the last time that uh, I don't handle criticism well, if that makes sense. I think we were just having a good discussion. I think we we're getting the wires crossed a little bit. I mean, it, it's fine. It's a, it's a podcast. It's good to be a little buttheads a little bit sometimes. I mean, that's you know, I think we we talk to each other what is it six hours a, a week every single week. You're gonna have that communication, you know, miscommunication sometimes. All right, uh, let's see here. Bud Dupree talking Moncrief versus. I really enjoyed the discussion concerning the Steelers salary cap. Hey, at least I know the salary cap. At least I have some worth there. Uh, going forward and possibly a retain a Bud Dupree next year really helped clarify the situation as Dave has very accurately laid out in the past. And now the Steelers have never really been in salary cap hell as national media has often claimed. They just had the privilege of paying a franchise quarterback market value. Knowing this, the question I would ask you both is whether you would consider it worthwhile to make, make the short term moves necessary to keep Bud blah, 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 restructure everyone and everyone will regard long term future so that a healthy Ben gets two shots in 2020 and 2021 as much of uh, uh, with as much of this D as possible after Ben is gone deal with the consequences while you look for the next franchise quarterback I don't think this approach would be a good idea but it does seem like Colbert has made more aggressive short-term moves recently such as trading up for Bush moving a first round draft pick to Minka and, and dipping more aggressively into bigger money on free agency pool with Nelson Barrett and Moncrief also I think Comparing the Moncrief signing to Sean Mahan is a bit unfair. Moncrief had a terrible start to the season, but due to Ben's injury and Mason slash Duck not really thrown to the wide receiver that much, he never really got the opportunity to redeem himself. With Fort getting released, Moncrief was just never going to get the chance at redemption either prior to time running out on him. Mahan had 16 games as a starter to re- redeem himself. We all know how that went. Yes, we do, Matthew. And to your point, you make a you make a good point, although five years from now we'll forget it. We might even forget it next week. Uh, Moncrief never really had a, a, a good chance to redeem himself past the Seattle game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I mean that's that's fair, but that's the NFL. That's the life of it. You make you don't make plays early. Someone takes your job and performs well. I mean that's how it goes. But the first point about the Dupree, I don't know exactly what I would do. You'd have to lay out the whole thing, and I have to look at my whole options. I can't say piece by piece what I might do. I mean I think obviously you you get Hayward extended. You probably restructure to it. I know Dave, you said you probably have to do to it restructure regardless of what happens with Dupree, even if he walks. Um, you may look at cutting somebody. I don't know who. I think I keep. I think I'm keeping Foster. I'm probably still keeping Alulu. Uh, I don't know. I'd have to go through. You'd have to really lay it out for me and let me choose uh, from the from options as opposed to me trying to bounce off the walls and try to tell you what I might do right now. I thought I did lay it out for you. <laughs> well, you did. No, I mean, I just I'd have to oh, I'm sorry. I'm talking bad. I'm, I'm talking down at no, you. Again. I apologize. No, it's, fine. it's fine. No, I mean, I I just don't know exactly what I would do. It would have to be you know I have to get the exact cap savings. Obviously, I would need to know what contract be offering Bud Dupree we, we have an idea of what that's going to be we don't know specifically obviously what that would be in a, in a long-term deal so it, it would depend on a lot of factors but I think as, as Dave and I have talked about this team's going to have a conversation we're going to talk about it a lot more and, and there is now a chance he returns but if Dupree returns it will be a very very expensive contract uh, dear Dave and Alex, uh, this is from Matt. Uh, let me start by saying Minka is worth the first round pick, even if we spiral and it becomes a top 10 pick. But if Colbert and Tomlin liked him so much, why didn't they trade up in the draft and get him? I like Terrell Evans, but I feel like he he is a replacement level player or slightly above. Wouldn't it have been uh, wouldn't it have been 
have to be cheaper to move up 17 spots than a first round pick. Uh, what do you think the price would have been to move up those spots? Maybe they tried. I mean, we'll never know. Um, and I'm sure there's some comfort in seeing what he's doing in the NFL and having the year in Miami and him playing well down there to make you feel more comfortable about trading him in, in the evaluation process. So those things are valid questions. I don't have a lot of good answers for you. Potentially, maybe they try to trade up or just maybe they made calls, realized it would cost too much. It's costly to get up that high in the, the first round where, where Minka went. So I don't know how much cheaper it would have been to, to do so. It might have been a little bit cheaper, but not by a whole lot. 28 to 10, Alex. Whew. Yeah, that's that's that. Probably was going to require at least I'd a first probably, round pick for next year. Yeah. yeah, it would have probably required a first round pick. Yeah. So, so, I mean, and yeah, I, maybe maybe they did. I, I think they knew it was it, it was just unattainable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's that's probably more like they just knew it was going to cost too much, and they had other safeties they wanted to, to look at. Uh, let's see. How about uh, one more? Hope all this one from Doug. Hope all is why I realized that we are looking at a four and four team with the with the defending NFL NFC champions coming to town. And just like Mike Tomlin, I don't like to deal in the hypotheticals. All that said, I was curious, Dave. What attributes what attributes made you so high on George Kittle coming out of Iowa prior to the 2017 draft? Thinking back on it, I don't remember hearing too much buzz on him, yet you seem to notice that he had the chance to be this, be a stud. The Steelers' 2017 draft class was already one of Colbert's best, but you, could you imagine if, if it included a potential all-pro all tight end, too? Yeah, I can't imagine it. I definitely can't imagine it. Oh, look, I, you know, I, I hit and miss on these things as well, too. Too, and there was a there was a ground there was a ground swell uh, of 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 uh, Kittle, uh, you know, talking uh, on, on Twitter throughout that whole process there. But the fur the further the further you dove into his tape and got past him being a damn dominant blocker, you saw that he could do other things, you know, as as a pass catcher and all too, and. I mean, just the play demeanor on this guy. This guy would drive people out of bounds and pancake them. Uh, I just say he jumped off tape. And I and the two positions I love scouting the most are tight ends and, and, and edge rushers. And, and you know, I, I he just stuck out to me. So that, that just happened to be one that I hit on. So, I mean, I, I miss it like, like I hit, you know, as well, too. But, uh yeah, uh, Dobbs, Dobbs over George Kittle. Yeah, that one's going to sting for a long time, I think. All right, how about that be enough for today? Yeah, that sounds good. We'll be back Friday. Probably going to be another two-hour show Friday, so buckle up for that one. All right, my buddy Dave wants to uh, thank everybody at goodieslv.com, G-O-O-D-Y-S-L-V.com for everybody that put in. Uh, orders for his popcorn. I was pretty blown away. He let me know it was like 30 or 40 orders I think he's already gotten. So uh, you know, we're trying to pick him up, too, as an advertiser uh, for the show moving forward. Uh, but I, I did get a text back from him. He was he was blown away about the response. So uh, you know, one last little free plug for him there as well, too. If you're thinking about getting some of that great popcorn of his, especially around the holidays here, I think he's going to work on some Steelers popcorn tins nice. uh to, for uh for the holiday as well too go to goodies lv.com got some free shipping right now on your orders uh, as as kind of an introductory as well too once again thanks for everybody that uh that that that, that has ordered for him and i hope you enjoy the popcorn as much as i do i buy 25 dollars worth a week of popcorn from him uh you can follow me on twitter at steeders deep you can follow alex on twitter at alex underscore kazora follow the show at terrible podcast email the show the terrible podcast at gmail.com uh, if you like what we do and hopefully you do and if you're hopefully not too mad at me at the way I treat Alex uh, and you want to donate to the show go to steedersdepot.com and hit the donate button up right navigational bar also if you want an ad free version of the site go to steedersdepot.com and hit the donate bar or hit the uh, ad free button up right navigational bar for $25 a year you can have an ad free version of steedersdepot.com a lot of people have it they love it and they think it's well worth the $25 or plus it puts money back into our pocket uh, as well, too. So in the meantime, until Friday, Alex and I will be back then uh, previewing the Steelers game against the I almost call them the St. Louis Rams, the Los Angeles <laughs> Rams. And as always, thanks for listening to the Terrible Podcast with Dave and Alex.